November 3rd. Okay, so um, who's going to... Um, Ms. Finch? I think that, that the slide um, that it is slide 12 shows some of the basic information she's talking about. But did you... Okay, so we're going to... I don't have that exhibit, so... Um, Okay, well, should I just proceed then? So, but hold on a second, but let me, Ms. Flynn, if you can take a look at this slide 12, and we'll have to figure out what happened to your uh, exhibit. Um, slide 12, um, does that work for you, Ms. Flynn, right there? Can, can you see the screen? Yes, yes. Okay. Does that work yes, for you? That looks good. Okay. All right, go ahead, Ms. Flynn. Um, well, I'll just read. I also submitted uh, pretty much my testimony at that same time. Um, so attached, I had two files. One is the map that's very similar to this. Um, maybe I should say my name, Joanne Flynn, 16815 Milltown Landing Road, okay. Brandywine. Um, so I submitted those two. Those two, And the second uh, information I submitted was uh, the decision by Prince George's County District Council for Special Exception 4462 which was 2005. Um, by way of introduction, I, I'm, I represent the Black Swamp Creek Land Trust and the Greater Baden C Citizens Association. We, we think that this information that I provided above is relevant to the property properties re referenced in this case. We have been and are seeking a determination and accountability concerning the commitments made in conditions of the special exception 4462. Our community association, Greater Bay and the Quasco Citizens Association, which I'm sure you've probably heard of. Oh yeah. Uh, was formed, <laughs> thank you. It was formed in uh, 2000 in response to a rubble fill operation that was proposed in this watershed. Um, so we became more aware of this watershed and what, and, and problems that might occur. Um, our land trust, the Black Swamp Creek Land Trust, was formed the very next year, 2001, to be proactive and a nonprofit arm of the community to help protect property up front and do what we could to promote conservation and environmental awareness in the community. So um, we work to enliven the preservation programs and educate community on options available through sale or donation of land conservation easements and on the business and economics of creating sustainable rural communities and lifestyles. So that, that we entered into a case against this um, community association, Greater Bay and Quasco, entered into a case against the rubble fill proposal in the Black Swamp Creek watershed and it took 10 years and it cost the community $220,000. So uh, we didn't want to have to go through that again. So, it, But we knew that mining is an activity that's permitted. They have a right to mine and go for special exception and so forth. And it's supposed to be a temporary use. So uh, the land will return over time. And uh, so whenever another mining, and this rubble fill was proposed over a former mining site not not shown on this map but ordering it i think and um so as part of an approval for sand and gravel operation that was applied for it was a, actually an extension of a previous special exception around 2004 2005 special exception 4462 in the black swamp creek watershed both community <laughs> groups black swamp and um Jabaca, Greater Bay and Quasco Citizen Association, um, we weighed in on this special exception. We worked with the mining company and the zoning hearing examiner and um, members of the community, and we wanted to um, put a covenant on the deed that no dumping of any kind would follow special exception when they completed their mining. And um, the special exception that preceded this extension of the special exception one of the community members happened to have it in her notes that they were going to dedicate 150 acres of the floodplain for the future stream valley park which is 
on the comprehensive map and um, or the county plan, a future stream park along the floodplain of Black Swamp. So we didn't make up this idea, but we asked, can you commit that in writing on the special exception that you're going for for the next five years and hope to finish their mining project within that time? And they did, and we were at the um, zoning hearing, examiner hearing, and um, they also made a couple other commitments that are uh, conditions of the special exception. The land was going to be donated to the Parks Department, and actually it's outlined there on the map that's shown in light green. And at one time, I didn't know because I didn't use PG Atlas very much. I had a hard time getting on there, but... Um, one of the people, one of the naturalists from the park department, I uh, replied to an email he wrote about something else and he wanted to find a way to get in there. And I said, well, yeah, I know people around there. We could go in there. And he said it was already on the PG Atlas outline. He thought it was already park property. So over the last 10 years, I think the permit for the state had um, expired uh, or, or had been finished in 2013. But it was never our job or the community's job to implement this and uh, to write off on this or to account for this. So uh, anytime I called park and planning, I talked with someone who might have referred me to someone else. But I understood it was always in the works. And when I met this one naturalist, maybe 2015 or 16, he had this, she showed it on the map of PG Atlas, and he thought it had already been done. And I thought, well, that's great because they, they never call us or proactively call us for information. So, um, uh, I guess so, what I, yeah, I've been trying to, more recently I've been trying to follow up on this and what happened with the dedication, but then the land got sold um, in 2018 and I called a person at Parks Department who I'd been in communication with and they didn't know it. They said it was, they were always working on meetings, and it was a long time between meetings. So anyway, now I find out that that property was sold to another party without the dedication being met. And um, I cannot get any accountability for these conditions of special exception, which I understand are not optional. And uh, so Madam Chair, this is, this is Peter Goldsmith, Senior Counsel. Um, I just want to uh, make the board aware that I mean, it, the, the testimony here is not relevant to this TCP because it's, I think it's outside the boundaries of the woodland conservation easement. But legal is aware of this question and is reviewing it to brief the board. Um, thank you, Mr. Goldsmith. Ms. Ms. Flynn, let me say a couple of things for a second. Um, sure. First of all, I can't see you, but it's good to at least hear you again. So it's, it's been a while. Um, secondly, um, I, I heard what council just indicated, and um, and um, and I think that and and I think that right now we are ta you've raised issues that we sh should look into, as council just indicated. But right now, what we have before us is is the um, restoration, and our, do do you have a position on the restoration or not? On the stream restoration? Well, I, uh, yes, thank you. It's good to hear that, uh, that it's being looked into. Um, well, at this time, we can neither support the proposals of the stream restoration easements in the Black Swamp or um, oppose them, but I just did not want them to confuse the issue that's already pending on these properties, to my mind. And um, so it's good to hear. I mean, we're familiar with the Black Swamp. Creek watershed, uh, and we'd like to learn the specifics of stream restoration plan. Okay. Um, how do you get into the plan? That kind of thing, and um, you know, we hope that they're using local materials and okay. no plastics, and okay. not causing more damage than is being done. And also, how these programs are funded and okay. what's the process? Miss Miss Flynn. So it could be available for Ms. other projects. Okay, so Miss Flynn, that. Some of those things, those are good questions, but they go beyond the scope of what's before us now. But I think you've raised some interesting points, and I'm, 
I, our, our attorneys are committed to talking with you. Um, you we, we do have your sign-up information because you have to disclose something when you sign up to speak in this matter. So I, I, I w encourage and we'll see to it that our staff follow up with you to answer some of these questions that you have about how, how it works and how, what constitutes the steam restoration, what, perhaps what materials they use. I don't know the answers to all of that. Um, and then to see what happened with the with the dedication um, that you're indicating was part of the special exception condition. Um, so that that's a separate category. But I th what I what I believe you you're doing is using this form because you've had some difficulty getting the answers that you need using this form to bring this to flag this to our attention even more, and we will commit to looking into that for you. And the other part I. I I think you did submit some materials, but they were p past the deadline. We do have a hard and fast um, deadline because we and we have to apply it uniformly across across the board. Um, so that's what it was um, with regard to your exhibits. Could I say a couple sure. of things? Sure. Quickly, it's about the uh, proposal. Um, number four, the number four on page five, it's about the under surrounding uses. Okay. I think that's not. Uh, I think that must have been copied from some other proposal because it does not sound like anything I hear about in, around here. The more to include the Schmidt Center, Baden Elementary School, or even mention that dedication if it was park property. Okay, Ms. Finch, I'm looking at um, paragraph number four on, on page five, as Ms. Flynn indicated. So we can look into that too, Ms. Finch, okay? Or unless you have yes, some response will. now. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ms. Flynn. My very last, last comment would be um, these are easements and I, I have ease, we have easements on our farm as well and and we're a land trust. And I know that with land trust it's good to have these easements monitored on a regular basis. And uh, I don't think that's been set up in the county and I just would like that to be considered. I mean we would be happy to participate in it. <clears throat> The extension of a park parks job, um, and uh, maybe Janine Nutter, I think she's on this call, would have something to say about the monitoring. Maybe she needs help with that, with the other types of conservation easements. Okay, um, is that it for you, Miss Flynn? Yes, thanks a lot for letting me speak. Absolutely, that's your right. Um, we thank you. Um, um, let me see if the board has any questions of you at this time, Madam Vice Chair. No questions, thank you. Okay, Commissioner Washington? No questions. Um, Commissioner Dorner? No questions. All right, uh, Commissioner Geraldo? No questions, Madam Chair. Thank you, okay. Ms. Nutter, is there anything you care to add at this point? No, <clears throat> no ma'am, there is nothing at this point. I think it's been covered very well, thank you. Okay. Um, we. Okay, so you know she does have a question. Ms. Flynn does have a question about the um, um, monitoring and whatnot. But I think this warrants a separate conversation that it because it goes beyond the scope of what's before us today. So I think it warrants a separate conversation and follow up with Ms. Flynn. Thank you, Ms. Um, Finch. Do you have anything else to add? No, I'm complete. Done. Thank you. Okay. Is there a motion? Madam Chair, it's Commissioner Washington. I move that we adopt the findings of staff and approve the placement of a woodland conservation easement associated with TCP 2-014-2019-01 over approximately 5.66 acres of a harp easement in addition to approving uh, the variance, a variance to section 2-5 dash one one nine eight as an apple eight <laughs> number eight for the placement of a woodland of the woodland conservation easement over a perpetual stream restoration easement and would also ask staff to uh, revisit the surrounding areas uh, based on uh, the testimony we just heard second oh. madam chair we have a motion and a second is there any discussion all in favor indicate by saying aye Aye. I'm aye. sorry, Madam Vice. I'm sorry, Madam Vice Chair. That's that's aye. aye. Commissioner Washington, aye. I heard uh, Commissioner Geraldo. Aye. Okay, Commissioner Dorner. Aye. 
The eyes have it unanimously. Thank you. Ms. Flynn, we will reach out to you, okay? Okay. Thank you. Um, also, okay, so the next item on the agenda was, um, uh, I, I should have mentioned this before. Item 10, um, with, with, we're pulling item t a 10 from the agenda. We can, Mr. Hunt, we, can we reschedule that for next week? Yes, Madam Chair, we can reschedule for next week as a supplemental item. Okay, thank you. I did have someone signed up on it. Um, Timothy Madden? We're scrolling down. Timothy Madden? You have no phone, folks? I, I think he signed up for uh, Woodyard Station. Not, not this case. Oh, okay. Okay. We had him on for this one. Okay. Um, all right. So next, okay. So, um, so that's removed and we'll put that on next week. Okay. Um, so next we have the um, consent agenda. Is there anyone here to oppose staff's recommendation on, on item 4B or any board member wish, who wishes to discuss uh, item 4B? If not, is there a motion? Madam Chair. I defer to Madam Vice Chair. <laughs> for item number four B, I move adoption of staff finance and approval of the item on the consent agenda in accordance with the recommendation of staff. I, I second. We have a motion and a second <laughs> to approve the consent agenda item four B. Madam Vice Chair? But I. Commissioner Washington? I. Commissioner DeWarner? Aye. Commissioner Giraldo. Aye. Okay, the next item on our agenda is item 5, which is detailed site plan 19077. It is 6400 Central Avenue, Exxon. I'm going to check and make sure we have the folks that we need for that case. Um, okay, Mr. Bishop, are you on? Yes, ma'am, present. Wonderful. Um, Himal Chand? Him him. Yeah, I, I, there he is. Can you unmute him? I, I am Bhupendra Prakash. I am a, the applicant, and him all should be in, but I don't know if he's, 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 he's a, he signed on. We're trying to unmute him. Is he unmute? Does he have to do it? Yeah, Mr. Chan, I think you have to unmute yourself. He's on via the web. Okay. Are you a caller? Yes. Madam Chair, this is Himal Chan. Uh, Mr. Bupender Prakas will be representing us okay. on the behalf of this application. Okay, thank you. Okay, wonderful. Mr. Bishop, you're on. You. Oh, and the other thing is we have, um, um, we do have an exhibit, but Mr. Bishop, you can go ahead. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. Good morning. For the record, Andrew Bishop with the Open Design section. Item 5 is the DSP for the installation of signage on the canopy columns and validation of the previously constructed gasoline canopy and canopy signage within the Build 2 line. A detailed site plan is required for all new development in the development district overlay zone for the approved sector plan and SMA for the Edison Road and Metro Town Center and vicinity and must comply with the approved development standards unless it meets one of the numbered exemptions for which this application does not. Slide two, please. The site is in planning area 72, Council District 7. Slide three, please. The property is located on the northeast corner of the intersection of Central Avenue and Addison Road. Slide 4, please. The site is in the CSC zone and is outlined here in green. It is bounded by the public rights of way of MD 214 to the south, Edison Road to the west, east by commercial uses in the CSC zone, and north by an unimproved alley commercial uses, and single-family detached dwellings 
in the CSC and R55 zones. Slide five, please. The property is in the approved sector plan and sectional map amendment for the Addison Road Metro Town Center and vicinity. Slide six, please. The area shown here shows the property which is currently improved with the gas station and food and, be and beverage use and is outlined in red. Slide seven, please. The site has been developed and is generally flat and slopes to the east, but contains no environmental features. Slide eight, please. This slide shows the master plan right away in the vicinity of the property. These include the arterial of Central Avenue, directly south of the site in red, and the collector, Addison Road, west of the site in green. Slide nine, please. This slide is a bird's eye view of the developed site and shows the location of the legally existing gas station, food and beverage building, and the, the canopy, which requires validation. Slide 10, please. This illustration shows the site plan for the property, which is accessed from three vehicular points, two on Central Avenue and one from Madison Road. The existing gas station was approved with SE 3282 and the food and beverage building use was approved with ROSP 3282. The food and beverage building is in the northeast portion of the site and faces Central Avenue. Between the building and the street is an existing gas station canopy, which was constructed between 1985 and 1990 without a permit and is not legally existing. The canopy is approximately 16 feet in height and provides coverage for four multi-product dispensers. The canopy is located approximately six to feet, six to eight feet behind Central Avenue and is within the 10 foot build to line established by the development district. The existing parking to serve the gas station and food and beverage store is located on the front and east side of the building. The site is further improved with landscaping along Maryland 214 and an existing freestanding sign, which is was the subject of DSDS 528. It is important to point out that the application before you is only for the approval of the proposed signage and validation of the canopy constructed without a permit. The other improvements on the property have been permitted and are legally existing. Slide 11, please. This slide shows the location of the existing and proposed signage on the property and is shown that and is shown by yellow markers on the diagram at the left of this slide. As stated previously, the canopy was never legally permitted and therefore neither were the canopy signs. These are being replaced in this application and are recommended to be approved as stated in the technical staff report. Slide 12, please. This slide shows <clears throat> the signage proposed on the individual product dispensers. Slide 13, please. The final slide shows the proposed blade signage above these product dispensers and the additional signage which is mounted to the canopy columns and are externally illuminated. In addition, this slide includes the detail of the proposed canopy mounted signage, which is shown in the bottom right of this slide. In conclusion, the Urban Design Section recommends the Planning Board adopt the findings of this report and approve detailed site plan DSP 19077-46400 Central Avenue, subject to the conditions found in the staff report. This concludes staff's presentation. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Bishop. Let's see if the Board has any questions of you at this time. Madam Vice Chair? No questions at this time, thank you. Okay, um, Commissioner Washington? No questions, thank you. Commissioner Dorner? No questions. Commissioner Giraldo? No questions, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, so, Mr. Um, Prakash, did I pronounce it correctly? Probably not. Yes, Mr. Prakash is here. Okay. Thank you. Do you wish to speak? I. I want to thank uh, 
Mr. Bishop for his level of support and just before you vote I would like to say that this canopy has existed since 1981 with the service station. Um, it is, I cannot say that it was necessarily built without a permit, but since 1981 we cannot find a permit for it. Mr. Bishop may clarify that. But the essence of the matter of validating this canopy within the building setback line is of critical uh, importance for me to explain. And that is, at one time in 1981, it was, it was not encroaching in the building setback. Sometime in around 1991, Central Avenue was widened and it took 20 feet from the property in front. And because of that 20 feet of taking this canopy, which was neither built or rebuilt, but remained in place, happens to be um, now in the new setback line. The setback line came into the canopy. The canopy never went into the setback line, if I may explain it that way. And um, we are asking your consideration to allow it to remain and uh, so that we can re-image this property with the new ExxonMobil graphics. Um, in 1991, this condition of the conflict between the setback and the existing canopy that has been there since 1981 was recognized in an approved uh, um, SE 3282 and it is clearly shown in that approval of the SE the, con the conflict between the new setback and the existing canopy. With that, I conclude and beg your uh, recommendation and vote for approval. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Prakash. Let's see if there are any questions. Madam Vice Chair? Not at this time. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Washington? No questions, but thank you as well, Mr. Prakash. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Um, Commissioner Dorner? No questions. The, the explanation was helpful in terms of how we're getting first okay. response, so thank you. Thank you. Commissioner thank you. Geraldo. No questions, Madam Chair. Okay, Mr. Bishop, do you have anything else to add? No, ma'am. Is there a motion? Madam Chair, I move that we adopt the findings of staff and approve the alternative development district standards A1 and 2 as outlined in staff report in addition to approving DSP Dash 19077, along with the condition as outlined in staff's report. Second. We have a motion and we have a second by Madam Vice Chair. Um, um, Madam Vice Chair? But I. Commissioner Washington? I. Um, Commissioner Geraldo? Vote aye. Commissioner Dorner? Aye. The ayes have it 5 0. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is item 6. Um, which is detailed site plan 07031 04, the Melford property, pod 6. Mr. Bishop, you're still on, right? Correct. Okay, Mr. Tedesco. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the planning board. Um, I'm here. Okay, Mr. Antonetti. He's on this one too. I'm here, Madam Chair. Okay, wonderful. Okay. Um, Ms. Camp? Marva Jo Camp? I give you a zing back. I think they might be calling me. Bye bye. Madam Chair, sorry. I'm, um, please remove my name from this one. I'm not going to speak on this one. I'll speak on the next one. Thank okay, you. thank you. We had you on both. Okay, thanks. Uh, Mr. Lenhart? Present. Mr. Bickle? Present. Mr. Roud? Andrew Hello. Roud? Hi. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, that breaks it up. Okay. Um, Kenneth Finley? I'm here. Okay. Joseph here. Ferris? Joseph Ferris? Present. John Shudin? Present. Okay, did I pronounce it correctly? Yes, you did. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Daniel Jackson. 
I'm on the next case. There was some confusion on that. Okay. Okay, well, all right. I got to make sure you sign up on the next case. Okay. Um, and then um, Scott Link. Madam Chair, I'm on, but I was also should be on the next case. Okay. All right. Okay, so that concludes my sign-up list. We have two exhibits, the applicants, um, revised conditions, and we also have presentation materials, exhibits. Um, ex um, so, Mr. Bishop, you're on. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the Planning Board. For the record, Andrew Bishop with the Open Design Section. Item 6 is a DSB for the development of a 61,809 square foot inpatient rehabilitation facility on proposed lot 5 and pod 6 in the overall Melford development. The applicant submitted revised conditions prior to the Tuesday deadline, as you mentioned, and will be prepared to discuss these if it is the desire of the board. Slide 2, please. The site is in planning area 71B, Council District 4. Slide 3, please. <clears throat> the site is in the southwest quadrant of the intersection of Marconi Drive and Melford Boulevard. Slide 4, please. The DSP is in the MXG zone within pod 6 in the southeastern portion of the overall Melford development. The area of this specific DSP is bound by Melford Boulevard to the north, US 50 to the south, Tesla Drive to the west, and vacant property in the MXT zone to the east. Slide 5, please. This area shows the boundary of the DSP outlined in red. The existing flex space warehouses are shown to the south and west of the vacant portion of the property, north of the stormwater pond, which is proposed to be developed with the inpatient rehabilitation facility that is the subject of this application. Slide 6, please. The site has been mass graded and is generally flat. No new environmental impacts are proposed with this application. Slide 7, please. This slide shows the master plan rights of way in the vicinity of the property. These include the freeway of US 50 directly south of the site in orange and the collector Melford Boulevard northwest of the site in green. Slide 8, please. This slide shows the overall mix of uses for the Melford development approved with CSB 06002-01. The location of the proposed inpatient rehabilitation facility is located in the southeast portion of the site and is indicated by a blue star. The mixed use and office use uses shown on the CSB are consistent with this proposed application. Slide 9, please. This slide shows the approved site layout of DSP 17031, which has been partially constructed. The area of this DSP is outlined in yellow and originally included office and flex space uses, but are proposed to be revised by the inpatient rehabilitation facility that is included with this application. Slide 10, please. This slide is a bird's eye view of the property and shows the location of the existing improvements as well as the vacant property on site, which will be the location of the facility and is outlined here in yellow. Slide 11, please. This slide was created by staff and shows the proposed facility superimposed on the bird's eye image and is outlined in yellow. Slide 12, please. This illustration shows the site plan for the property, which is accessed from two locations on Melford Boulevard, one on the eastern and one on the western portions of the site. The main entrance to the facility faces Melford Boulevard and includes a covered port crochet over the circular drop-off area. Parking for the property is provided by surface parking lots, which encircle the building and are located on all sides of the facility. A courtyard is proposed on the south side of the building and includes a site stimulation and therapy course. Staff is recommending details of all the site furnishings and equipment proposed in this area be shown to reflect all the improvements included in this DSP. Slide 13, please. 
The following slides show the architectural design of the building, which is generally flat and proposes variations in height across the building face to break up the mass of the building. This slide shows the front of the building facing Melford Drive on the top of the slide and shows the eastern building face that will be visible from Marconi Drive on the bottom of your slide. Slide 14, please. The building volumes, different colors, and architectural materials such as glass, brick, and EFITs proposed in the courtyard provide architectural interest. On this slide, you will see the rear of the building with the therapy courtyard on the top of the slide and the west face of the building on the bottom of the slide. Slide 15, please. This slide shows the proposed signage locations on the site, which include building mounted signage above the main entrance and two freestanding signs at each entrance to the facility and are shown with blue dots on this site plan. Slide 16, please. This slide is of the backlit building mounted signage above the main entrance. Slide 17, please. This slide shows the internally illuminated freestanding signage at the site entrance. Staff is recommending that additional seasonal landscaping be added to the base of these freestanding signs to beautify the site and provide seasonal interest. Slide 18, please. The site <clears throat> the last slide of the proposed signage includes building mounted signage on the inpatient rehabilitation facility, which shows the address of the property. Staff finds the signage proposed with the application acceptable. Slide 19, please. The final slides of this presentation show the Type 2 Tree Conservation Plan with the application. As previously stated, this site is part of the overall Melford development and has been the subject of a number of DSVs and TCP2 revisions. Slide 20, please. The TCP2 has been reviewed by staff and is consistent with prior TCP2s approved and proposes to preserve woodland on the eastern portion of the site. In conclusion, the urban design section recommends the planning board adopt the findings of this report and approve detailed site plan DSB 07031-04 and TCP 2036-99-16 for Melford for the Melford property pod six, subject to the conditions found in the staff report. The applicant has proposed revised condition language, which has been reviewed by staff and are in agreement with the proposed language. This concludes staff's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. I think and we've heard from the city of Bowie too, they too are okay with the revisions as well, right? Okay. Um, that is correct. Okay, thank you. Let's see if there are any questions of you. Um, Madam Vice Chair? No questions, thank you. Commissioner Washington? No questions, thank you. Commissioner Dorner? No questions. Commissioner Geraldo? I have no questions, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Tedesco, you're on. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair. Thank you for the record, Matthew Tedesco with the law firm of Beth Mihosi here on behalf of the applicant Encompass Health. Um, with me this morning, uh, I have Mr. John Shudin. He's the director of design and construction for Encompass Health. We have David Soltes from, uh, <laughs> David Bickle from Soltes, excuse me. Uh, Mike Lenhart from Lenhart Traffic and Consulting, and Joe Ferris from Frederick Architects, who's the architect on the project. Okay. We also have with us representatives of the St. John's property, who are the owners of the of Belford and the subject property, um, Andrew Roud, Ken Finley, and Jennifer Hearn, and my co-counsel on this, on behalf of the St. John's property, is Mr. Robert Antonetti, who are okay, with us. Okay, well. I don't have Let's Jennifer Hearn. I don't have Jennifer Hearn. Uh, really? I don't have Jennifer Hearn on my sign-up list. Okay. She may be on for another matter. I just didn't want to be rude and not okay. include her. But don't um, be trying to she, slip anybody in either. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay. She, she doesn't need to speak. If, okay. If that's no. okay. I just want to introduce her because okay. she's part of the St. John's team. Okay. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Um, but thank you for that clarification. Um, I want to thank Mr. Uh, Bishop for his review of this application as well as your other sections um, and for their comments and support and staff report. Um, we, as you can imagine, this property being within the boundaries, the municipal boundaries of the city of Bowie, we did 
undertake a uh, fairly lengthy review process with the city of Bowie. Mr. Stevens um, is not on the line today. However, the city of Bowie did send, submit a letter, which I know was part of your backup yes. in support of this application. We would like to just publicly thank the city for its support. But just so you know, and the board knows, um, on September 24th, we had a stakeholders meeting. Um, on October 13th, uh, we had the uh, Bowie Advisory Planning Board hearing. And on October 19th, we had the mayor and city council for which um, both the BAPB as well as the mayor and city council were all unanimous votes of support for this detailed site plan. So we're very pleased um, to represent that. And I think with just the fact that Mr. Stevens is not here and the letter is submitted, um, evidences our efforts with the city of Bowie. Um, this application seeks to have an inpatient rehabilitation facility approved on lot five of pod six. Um, I did submit as part of our backup exhibit two. I don't know if you have the ability to share that on your screen. I'm, I'm hopeful everyone has that in paper, but I have it on mine if we if, if we want to share okay. it. That presentation material was what was shared with the city of Bowie in the stakeholder meeting, the BAPB hearing, as well as the mayor and city council hearing. So we wanted to include we have that it. material. Okay, but we have it here. But if you, um, hold on, Mr. Flanagan, do you want to show it or do you prefer that um, Mr. Tedesco show it? Okay, Mr. Tedesco, we're going to allow you to share the, your screen. <clears throat> okay, fantastic. I see you're not going with no shave November, no shave Ember, but okay. You, um, Nobody is. That's for all. That's for all of our benefit. Trust me. Okay. <laughs> um, can you all see that? Yes. Okay. So uh, again, this material was just being shared with you all um, as it was shared with the city of Bowie through, through its process. Um, this provides a, a more detailed overall perspective of where the, uh, we call it a, the um, inpatient rehabilitation facility or IRF for short is located. It's located in the um, southeastern portion of the Melford property um, outlined in yellow here. One of the things that I'm really happy to um, share and represent is Encompass Health as the nation's um, largest owner operator of IRF facilities in the United States. Um, as of the end of 2019, so this data is, a, is already a, almost a year old, um, they had 133 IRF facilities uh, in, the, in the United States, employed over 31,000 uh, employees, and had 186,000 inpatient discharges. This slide we prepared to just give a summary for everyone who may not be as familiar with inpatient rehabilitation facilities as far as what they are, uh, and, and more importantly, what they are not. Um, I'm just gonna slide, I'm just gonna move my screen over. So um, as I mentioned, Encompass Health Corporation is the leading provider of post-acute medical services in the nation and it's the largest owner and operator of inpatient rehabilitation facilities. Um, they treat patients who have undergone treatment for acute medical events such as strokes, spinal cord injuries, neurological conditions, amputations, lower extremity fractures, or joint replacements and following treatment need short-term intensive physical rehabilitation prior to the patient's return to the community. An IRF, and this facility is not excluded, an IRF does not offer comprehensive inpatient services such as surgical or diagnostic services and do not operate emergency departments. Further, Encompass IRFs do not provide drug and alcohol or mental health rehabilitative services. The purpose of um, an IRF facility is to provide specialized inpatient health care dedicated to improving, maintaining, or restoring physical strength, cognition, and mobility to patients after illness, surgery, or, or injury. Um, the average stay of a patient is approximately 13 days, and the average age of a patient is 71 years old. This slide um, just shows a breakdown of the common diagnoses. Um, as I Briefly mentioned before, neuro neurological makes up the, the, the biggest percentage, followed by stroke, disability, brain dysfunctions, orthopedic conditions, fractures, trauma, cardiac conditions, spinal cord, 
replacement, joints, hips, knees, things of that sort, uh, lower extremities, amputation, and others. You must meet a administration, admission, excuse me, an admission criteria to be admitted into the facility. Um, you have to be able to undergo three hours of therapy a day or 15 hours per week. Um, physician care three times per week and nursing care is provided 24 seven um, and the patient must be medically stable. This slide shows the uh, uh, service providers that are provided for in these facilities. Uh, again, they run the, the, the gamut of physical uh, rehabilitation physicians, nurses, physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech language therapists, respiratory therapists, case managers, and post-discharge services. Uh, again, as Mr. Bishop indicated in your staff report, this facility initially phase one proposes 60 beds, approximately 62,000 square feet. Um, total investment of approximately $47 million. We included this slide just to show some three dimensional and uh, renderings of recently constructed facilities throughout the country. So we provided four examples on that slide. And just to, and again, not subject to a detailed site plan, but just to be as transparent and informative as we could be, we provided in the following slides just to show um, examples of the interior amenities of the facilities. Uh, this slide shows the um, daily living suites, um, the nurses reception station, uh, the reception area of the entry lobby, as well as the therapy gym. Okay. This slide is a representation of the uh, facilities. They're all private rooms, as you would expect, all ADA accessible. And some more just slides of internal space, interior spaces uh, for everyone's edification. And you are in agreement mm -hmm. with the staff recommendation, right? <laughs> so I can conclude this now, Madam, Madam Chair. I just wanted to share that with you. So I'll stop sharing my screen if that's okay. It's okay. <laughs> and um, so thank you for your indulgence for letting us go through that. But yes, we are in full agreement of the staff's recommendation. We had a minor, two minor revisions to conditions as part of applicants exhibit one that we vetted with your staff. Um, we would respectfully request the board's approval of those modifications. They're fairly minor in nature. I'm happy to go through them if you would like. And then we would only ask that any findings that are impacted by those revisions. Uh, I think the only one that is, is, is finding number 13 on page 28. This needs to be tweaked just slightly. Um, other than that, Madam Chair, we are in full agreement and um, would respectfully request the board's approval of this matter and we have the full team assembled here today to answer any questions that I may not be able to answer and with that I'll conclude thank you okay thank you Mr. Tedesco um we have a number of people that I introduced and Mr. Tedesco um, um introduced as well um I just want to make sure that most of those people are if, if we have questions right as you indicated only if um, I don't know about Mr. Only Antonetti needed. Only, only as needed Madam Chair okay um, so I, um, so only if there are questions and also, um, that's your team. Mr. Antonetti is not part of your team though, is he? Mr. Antonetti, do you wish to speak? Uh, hi, Madam Chair. Um, I, I associate, um, myself and St. John Properties, uh, with the comments and presentation of Mr. Sudesco. We're very pleased to, uh, hopefully see this project move forward. So thank okay, you for thank uh, you. allowing me the opportunity to comment. Thank you. Let's see if the board has any questions of you, Mr. Tedesco. Madam Vice Chair? No questions. Thank you. Commissioner Washington? Uh, just a clarifying question. Mr. Tedesco, you mentioned a slight change to uh, finding number eight on page 13. I didn't get that. No, it was fi finding number 13 on page uh, 28. And that would just be to mirror new condition 1C. Okay, thank you. Thing. Okay. Um, that's it. Somebody, I didn't hear who that was. Okay, that's it. That was it. Oh, that was it. Okay, that was it. Okay, okay, that was it. Commissioner um, Joyner? No question. Commissioner Geraldo? I just have a quick question. Okay. Mr. Tedesco, does, uh, do they provide memory care services at this facility, if you know? Um, I would have to defer to Mr. Shooting on that. I don't, that wasn't on my master list, so I'll defer to, to John. If John, do you mind answering that question? 
John Shannon, my name's Leonard Alton. Not offer memory care services. This is a physical rehabilitation. Okay, thank um, you. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you, John. Thank you. Okay, if there are no other questions, we have no other speakers. Um, is there a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Washington, uh, I move that we adopt the findings of staff and approve DSP-07031-04. And TCP-2-036-99-01 along with the associated conditions as outlined in staff's report and it's further modified by applicant exhibit number one and would also ask the final resolution incorporate the minor adjustment to finding number 13 page 28 as it relates to uh, the amended condition and applicant exhibit number one. Second. Commissioner Gerald, second. Okay. All right. Well, Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Washington. Uh, Madam Vice Chair, beat you to it, Commissioner Geraldo. Uh, Madam Vice Chair? But I. Um, Commissioner Washington? Aye. Commissioner Geraldo? Aye. Commissioner Dorner? Good aye. Okay, um, the ayes have it, 5 0. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to take, how about we take, because the next two cases may take a little bit, so how about we take a health break for just a few minutes and then resume at, um, what time is it now? Okay, about um, 12, 10. 10. 10. Okay, 12, 10. Thank you. In session. We have before us item 7, which is detailed site plan 20026, Woodyard Station, phase 2. Let me make sure we have our speakers. Um, let's see. Okay, we have uh, Mr. Burke. Are you on? I am on, Madam Chair. Wonderful. Mr. Hatcher? Chris Hatcher? There he is. Scroll down. I'm sure. Sorry okay. about that. Thank you. Okay. Um, Marva Jo Camp? I'm here, Madam Chair. Okay. Daniel Jackson? Present. Scott Link? Present. Okay. Timothy Madden? Okay. We got. Okay. Timothy Madden? Can we check the phones? Yeah. Timothy Madden, are you on? Oh, we do have Jennifer. Wait a minute, is Jennifer Hearn signed up? No. She's on. Okay. Um. Okay, so Timothy Hearn is not doesn't seem to be on. Um, I get him to join He's on another call, but uh, I'll get him. Okay, no worries. Okay, um, Mr. Burke, you're on. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, good afternoon, good Madam afternoon. Chair and members of the Planning Board. Uh, my name is Thomas Burke, and I'm with the Urban Design Section. The proposal before you is a detailed site plan, DSP-20026, which includes a Type 2 tree conservation plan, DCP-2-014-2020-01, for Woodyard Station Phase 2, and is listed as Item 7 on the agenda. The applicant is seeking approval of this detailed site plan for the development of the 46 multifamily dwelling units and a 112-unit apartment housing for the elder. Uh, next slide, please. The site is located in the southern portion of Prince George's County in planning area A1A, Council District 9. Next slide, please. More specifically, the site is located on the north side of Woodyard Road near its intersection with Branch Avenue in Clinton. Slide 4, please. 
Subject property shown here is located within the MXT zone. This 5.53 acre parcel being developed with this phase is within the 21.82 acre property, which received conceptual site plan approval on March 12th of this year. Council Resolution CR 13-2018 placed this property into the MXT zone and it is subject to the development concepts in the uh, Central Branch Avenue sector plan, which envisioned this site as commercial mixed use and residential medium high density set on a traditional pattern, uh, grid pattern, excuse me. Slide five, please. The site is also within the military installation overlay, which establishes a maximum building height of 230 feet for this site. This proposed, the, uh, the proposed buildings are well within this limit with a maximum height of 49 feet. Slide six, please. This aerial photo illustrates the pre-development conditions of the property showing the site is fully wooded. Slide seven, please. The site is relatively flat with no regulated environmental features located on or near the property. Slide eight, please. The master plan right-of-way map shows frontage on the extension of Mimosa Avenue, a master plan primary road shown here in pink, curving down and extending towards Old Branch Avenue. Slide nine, please. To put this parcel into context, this is the approved conceptual site plan for the total of 21.82 uh, for the acres of MXT zone property. The subject of this application is the darker orange area shown here in the lower left of the screen. Circulation to and around the site from Mimosa Avenue. Wow, uh, following. There we go. There we go, right there. Circulation to and around the site from Mimosa Avenue and Woodyard Road are shown here in blue. The site infrastructure for the public roads was recently approved through a previous DSP. Slide 10, please. Zooming into the subject property, we see here the multifamily component of this mixed use development, the two buildings shown in gray. The multifamily building on the left will front on Mimosa Avenue, with the senior apartments shown on the right fronting on both Mimosa Avenue and Woodyard Station Road. The parking for both buildings will be in the rear, screened from the public realm, and with two access points, one between the buildings and one on the Woodyard Station Road uh, to the south of the senior apartments. A top lot has been provided for the multifamily and can be seen on the far left south of the building. So brown hexagon area just south of the building at the uh, western property line. The townhouses shown here in brown are for illustra illustrative purposes only and will be evaluated with the subsequent detailed site plan. Slide 11, please. The residential buildings will be four stories composed of a combination of brick, cementitious siding, and vinyl. The buildings are proportionally divided into smaller forms to minimize visual impacts by providing recesses across the front and rear facades, multi-story box window product projections, mixed materials and color patterns by section and floor, and gable end enhancements along the roof line. The multifamily building shown here scales down to a narrower width and to three stories on each end. This will reduce the dominance of the structure, particularly at the Can western right? property line, right? providing a softer transition to the adjacent R80 zone vacant property. Uh, slide 12, please. The main entrances. Uh, slide 12, please. There, thank you. The main entrances to the buildings are centrally located and, and facing Mimosa Avenue. Rear entrances are also provided Beverly facing Simmons the parking lot on as shown on the top <coughs> images. Well, she must be on if she's in the chat. <clears throat> okay. the, entrance, the entrances to both buildings on the road frontage are articulated by a projecting building section and a covered entryway. The central building section is capped with a more prominent gable end, which includes windows. <coughs> The multifamily building further accentuates the entry with a, with a two-story course of brick on the frontage that extends from a brick water table around the base of the building. Slide 13, please. The senior apartment building incorporates the same architectural elements and, as can be seen on the top image magnification to the left, will include a porte cochere 
at its rear entrance. Slide 14, please. Two monument signs are proposed with this application, one in the median of each driveway entrance. The signs will be double-faced and carry the name of the community. Slide 15, please. At the time of preliminary plan, it was determined that the mandatory parkland dedication would be met for the development through on-site private facilities. In addition to a game room in the seniors, senior apartments and the, and the fitness room in the multifamily building, the applicant is proposing a tot lot shown in the upper left on this screen. Benches on plazas located at the front building entrance as well as other locations on the site. Bicycle racks and bicycle storage lockers. Slide 16, please. These are shown here in each building with separate entrances specifically for the storage locker use. Additionally, other recreation facilities will be provided throughout the community with subsequent phases. Slide 17, please. The overall property is subject to the provisions of the Woodland and Wildlife Habitat Conservation Ordinance, a Type 2 Conservation Plan TCP 2-014-2020-01 was submitted with the DSP application showing areas of woodland removal, preservation, and reforestation. The urban design staff recommends that the planning board adopt the findings of this report and approve detailed site plan DSP 20026 and Type 2 Tree Conservation Plan TCP 2-014-2020-01 subject to the conditions contained in the staff report dated October 21st, 2020. With that, Madam Chair, this concludes the staff presentation and I thank you for your time and consideration to this application. Um, okay, thank you, Mr. Burke. Let's see if the board has questions of you at this time. Madam Vice Chair. Not at this time, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Washington. Nope, no questions, thank you. Um, Commissioner Dorner. No questions. Commissioner Geraldo. No questions. Okay, Mr. Hatcher, you're on. For the record, my name is Chris Hatcher with the law firm Lurch Early and Brewer here on behalf of the applicant, TAC Woodyard LLC, uh, in this detailed site plan. If you'd like to first, uh, here with me today is Scott Link, representing the ownership, as well as um, Marva Jo Camp, who's been coordinating with the community, and Dan Jackson and uh, Tim Madden from the civil team and, and they're prepared to speak if, if you all have any questions. Uh, I'd like to first thank staff for coordinating with us on this, uh, this community, you guys, and, and, and most importantly, the community stakeholders. As you all know, the community down here is extremely active and uh, through, through the course of every uh, approval, the CSP, the preliminary plan, the infrastructure DSP, uh, we've been uh, actively uh, coordinating with them and trying to respond to any comments um, throughout the entire process. Uh, with, with, with that being said, we have reviewed the staff report and the findings of fact and conditions that are contained in it. Uh, we respectfully request, and we, and we have no proposed revisions to any of the conditions, so we respectfully request that the board uh, adopt the findings of facts and conclusions of law contained in uh, the staff report and approve DSP 20026 and the associated TCP 214 2020-01. Uh, um, we're prepared to respond to any questions that you may have. Um, thank you, Mr. Hatcher. Um, any questions, Madam Vice Chair? No questions, thank you. Commissioner Washington? No questions. Commissioner Geraldo? No questions, thank you, Mr. Patch, for uh, engaging the community and, and this camp. Um, Commissioner Dorner? No questions. Um, okay, so that concludes my sign-up list. The, uh, the speakers here are for questions only. Is there a motion? Madam Chair, Commissioner Washington, uh, and I move that we adopt the findings of staff and approve DSP-20026 and TCP2-014-2020-01 along with the associated conditions as outlined in staff's report. We have a motion by Commissioner Washington. Second, for you. Uh, <laughs> I was waiting for Mr. Geraldo. Okay, okay. Um, we have a second by Vice Chair Bailey. Um, Madam Vice Chair? But I. Commissioner Washington? I. Commissioner Dorner? 
No, no. Commissioner Geraldo. No, no. The ayes have it five zero. Thank you. Um, okay, so the next item on our agenda um, is item nine. It is preliminary plan 4 20006, Freeway Airport. Um, I'm going to check and make sure we have the people who have signed up. Um, Eddie Diaz Campbell. Hold on, we're looking for you, Mr. Diaz Campbell. Present. Okay, wonderful. Um, Mr. Antonetti. Present, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Horn, you got. I'm, I'm here on behalf. Okay, Mr. thank Horn. you, Mr. Ferrante. I'm present. Okay, Mr. Roud. Present. Uh, Ms. Hearn. Present. Ken Finley. I see you there. He, he's there. Okay. I think you might need to unmute on your end, Mr. Finley. We see you, though. Okay. He's here. Okay. Um, Rachel Leisinger? Present. Adam Blau? Uh, present. I keep getting that wrong, don't I? Uh, Mike no, Lennart? No, you said it right. Oh, okay, good. Thank you. Mike Lennart? Present. Um, Gary Ehrlich? Present. Kim Rodenhauser. She's not able to join today, Madam Chair. Okay. Beverly Simmons. Present. Okay. Carol Boyer. Present. Millie Hall. Present. I'm um, Kathleen Barris. Present. Madam no, it's a Beers. How did I pronounce it? Yes, you did. Okay, thank you. Um, Miller Einsel. Present. James Riley. Present. Eric Afuqua. I saw your name. Yeah, scroll down a little bit. I just saw it, I think, twice. Eric Afuqua. Okay, just do it. There it is, right there. Okay. We're unmuting you. I think you might have to unmute yourself also. Eric Afuqua? He's on the phone, Madam Chair. Okay. Okay. We don't see, um, and he's not caller seven? Okay, so we don't have him on the phone. We have we have him. No. Okay, Mr. Fokwa, there you are. Hello. Okay, got it. How? Okay, you're present, obviously. Adam Levi. Present. Michael Bridges. Present. Okay, so we have almost twenty people. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, we hear you, but can can you hear us? Mr. Afuqua? We hear you, Mr. Afuqua. Okay. Um, okay, so we have almost 20 people, or a little over 20 people signed up on this matter, on all sides combined. Um, this is a long case. It is not CB17. That's beyond our control at this point. Um, I do want to ask people, someone asked the question last week um, about time limits. Um, I don't have official time limits. We will not limit you to three minutes, but we do have some ground rules. All testimony has to be re relevant and consistent with the law. All, all, we do ask that you be considerate of everybody who wish to, wishes to speak. So we don't want anyone to, to go on and on and ad infinitum and being unduly um, repetitive to prevent others, which you know could curtail the opportunity for others to speak. We want everyone to have an opportunity to speak if they so choose. Um, that's, uh, um, also, if you wish to associate yourself 
with if you're impressed by someone's speak um, comments and you wish to associate yourself with that person's comments you can just merely say so I associate myself with the comments of so-and-so if you wish to do that and then add your own comments you can do that as well um, um, if you wish to say you're a proponent or opponent you have that opportunity as well so you have options here and plus we have a lot of written documents too and people can submit on that if you so choose um, um, so we just wanted to make sure that everyone has options but we, the main thing is just be the testimony has to be relevant and be considerate of everyone who wishes to speak we'll try to get through this as far as we can before we break for lunch um, okay so Mr. An uh, no, Mr. Diaz Campbell you're on and that I mean that includes everybody Mr. Mr. Antonetti your side as well we don't need anybody to be unduly repetitive okay thank you Madam Chair Okay. Before I begin my presentation, I have a, a question. We had a uh, motion to oh, dismiss the case. Yes, let me. Yeah, let me. Let me. Let me. Yes, thank you. Let me address that for now. We do have a motion to dismiss. Let me say this: um, there's no such process for the planning board particularly with regard to a preliminary plan of subdivision because the rules for a preliminary plans of subdivision and the hearing deadlines are set forth in state law in the land use article in the annotated code of Maryland so if you um, state law dictates that a preliminary plan of subdivision must be heard within the 70 day time frame there is a possibility for a second 70 day time frame only if the applicant grants a waiver which the applicant does not have to grant but sometimes they're willing to do so and sometimes not so if you don't act within if the planning board doesn't make a decision on this case within 70 days absent a waiver and this is the last day for of that 70 days then the application is deemed approved automatically by operation of law and all the conditions that are set forth in here um, would not there would be no conditions of approval and believe me this case has conditions so um so the problem with that is that we um it's sort of you we want to be careful what we what we do here because if you inaction on our part is an automatic approval for the applicant automatic no conditions um mr goldsmith is there anything you'd like to add to that or or if you wish to cite the specific provision within the land use article if you wish yes well, okay madam chair that, that section 23 205 in the land use article um, and I just also want to point out that under the board's uh, rules of procedure the board did have the authority to continue the case to this week yes thank you um, anybody we can we always have the ability to, to continue a matter we just did that today earlier with something um, to another date and time as specified at the previous hearing so um, I don't you know if Thank you, Madam Chair. Can I ask a question, please? This is Millie Hall. You can ask a, a quick question, but then I'm going into the staff uh, the presentation. Yes, Ms. Hall. Okay. The, the only reason I signed the motion is because the day you called the roll, no one was there from the... Uh... Mr. Mr. Ferranti was there. He was? Yes, indeed. He answered and he spoke. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Um, and he and he addressed the continuance actually okay um, but we don't want to do that because you would you would I don't think Ms. Hall that you would like a, 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 a an automatic approval with no conditions so um, yeah, the conditions are set for commence on um, pages 29 through, I mean there are many of them so uh, so we okay, have like, thank you. okay thank you um, so Mr. Diaz Campbell Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. For the record, I am Eddie Diaz Campbell, Senior Planner with the Subdivision and Building Section. Item number nine on the agenda is the preliminary plan of subdivision for a freeway airport, 4 2006. The subject project proposes 509 lots and 62 parcels for the development of 416 townhouse units and 93 single family detachments. The existing airport on the site is to be raised. As a round housekeeping, staff has received over 70 items of additional data, which were received before the noon deadline on November 3rd. These items include both exhibits from the applicant and letters and documents from citizens in opposition. The full list of items is in your commissioner's list. Please bless 
Um, Mr. Diaz Campbell, before you do that, I want to say, we, our board, these are my exhibits right here. I don't know if you can see this. These are my exhibits. We have been through every, every last one of them. Um, some of them are, are, are duplicates in terms of the, um, the petitions for judicial review, both the pro se ones and the ones from Mr. Hulse, um, um, Carol Holzer. Um, um, but we have been, just for everyone um, who's in our viewing and listening audience, just know that the planning board does have that and we have poured over these exhibits. Thank you. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Mr. Diaz Campbell. Okay. Um, if I could have the next slide on the screen, please. All right. The site is located in the northeastern part of Prince George's County within setting area 74A in Council District 6. Next slide, please. More specifically, the site is located on the south side of US 50 in the top left quadrant of its intersection with Church Road. Next slide, please. The design map shows the property is in the residential agricultural, or RA zone. Also visible are the boundaries of a previous special exception for the site, SE-4375, which approved a weather radar tower for the airport. To the north of the property is DF-50, a vacant land in the mixed use community zone beyond. To the west is right away for Pesco Power Line, a single family detached dwelling beyond, both of which are, off, are also in the RA zone. To the south and southeast are vacant land and single family detached dwellings in the RA zone. To the east is Church Road, a vacant land owned by MNC PPC in the reverse in the reserved open space zone beyond. Also east of Church Road are single family detached dwellings in the residential estate zone. Next slide, please. The overlay map shows that the property is subject to several aviation policy areas. Most of the property is in the APA-5, which, in, which encompasses an area on either side of the airport runway. Portions of the property are also in the APA-1, APA-3M, and APA-6. The APAs are expected to cease effect once the airport is decommissioned. I will discuss the APAs and the decommissioning further on in our presentation. Next slide, please. The aerial photograph shows the airport currently on site. The site also includes woodlands and a stream valley. Also visible are the neighborhoods of single family attached homes surrounding the site. Next slide, please. This photo shows another view of the site from an aerial perspective. This view is taken from the west. Next slide, please. The site map shows that the site has a varied topography, but generally slopes downward towards the on site stream valley to the south. Next slide, please. The master plan right of the map shows the US 50, a freeway abutting the site to the north, and Church Road, a collector road abutting the site to the east. About 19,000 square feet of right of way dedication to Church Road is proposed in this application. Next slide, please. The eight critical intersections determined to be impacted by the development, including two proposed site, site access points, are shown by the yellow boxes on this slide and are further described in detail in the staff report. The analysis performed by staff indicates that under total traffic conditions, all eight critical intersections will operate adequately. Next slide, please. This slide shows the aviation policy areas on the site as well as the full extent of the APA associated with the operation of freeway airports. The APA regulations identify permitted, prohibited, and site plan approval uses for each of the APAs adjacent to the airport. The regulations also set several development standards and guidelines that apply so long as the airport is active and licensed for public use by the Maryland Aviation Administration. Because the airport will be decommissioned, the APA regulations will no longer apply. The applicant provided a letter from the MAA outlining the steps needed to post the airport. They intend to ensure these steps have been completed prior to approval of final plan. Next slide, please. The preliminary plan shows 509 lots and 62 parcels, outlined in red. The existing and proposed rights of way are shown in blue, with public streets in dark blue, private streets in light blue, and access easements in the lightest blue. Primary management area is shown in magenta. Adequate public facilities, including water, sewer, fire, rescue, and police facilities, will be available to service sites. 
Exactly. This slide shows the northern portion of the study. The unmitigated 65 decibel noise contour is shown by the orange line. Visible features shown on this slide include a proposed noise wall in the northwest part of the site, which is intended to mitigate noise in outdoor activity areas and inside residences. A trail loop between the houses and near the city. Proposed recreation areas on blocks H and J. An also a clubhouse location at the southern of the two site entrances. Next slide, please. This slide shows the middle portion of the site. Most of the single family attached homes are in this portion, in the central recreation area on block R. Next slide, please. This slide shows the southern portion of the site. The most notable feature on this site is an access easement proposed from the public road to the Flick property southwest of the site. The Flick property lacks public road signage, and so this easement is necessary for continued access to that property. Next slide, please. The following four slides are exhibits provided by the applicant that show various site features. This first one shows the mix of units proposed. The townhouses are proposed to be a mix of 22 foot wide and 24 foot wide units. The 22 foot wide units and some of the 24 foot wide units will be rear loaded, while the rest of the 24 foot wide units will be front loaded. Next slide, please. This slide shows that most of the townhomes will be in groups of six units or less. Each of the groups will have seven or eight units. Having groups of more than six units requires approval from the planning board per section 27 433 b 2 of the zoning ordinance. That recommends the board approve the groups of seven and eight units. Next slide, please. This exhibit shows the sidewalk and trail facilities proposed by the applicants. Our crosswalks are proposed at major intersections. So it is not shown in this exhibit that Alpine will also be required to provide six foot wide shoulders along Church Road with Sharrow, their sidewalk along the Church Road frontage, as well as, ten, as well as a ten foot wide shared use path along Church Road at the intersection to the site's roadway entrances. Next slide, please. This exhibit shows parking areas proposed by the applicants. Although parking is not approved with a preliminary plan submission, it will be further evaluated at the time of detailed site plan. Based on the things that it appears that the parking requirements of the site will be met. Two parking spaces are proposed in the driveway of each unit, and the remaining requirements will be covered by a mixture of on-street parking and small off-street parking areas. Next slide, please. This application is subject to the Woodland Conservation Ordinance, and the TCP-1 has been filed with the application. This TCP1 shows the subject parcels in red and the right of ways in blue. Prior management area is shown outlined in magenta. Women preservation areas are shown in dark green, while the afforestation areas are shown in light green. Next slide, please. This slide shows the northern portion of the site. Next slide, please. This slide shows the central portion of the site. It also shows the locations of four specimen trees, which are for removal on the red X's. Next slide, please. This slide shows the southern portion of the site. It also shows the location of one additional specimen tree which is proposed for removal. The office submitted a very request supporting removal of the five trees, and staff supports the request as set forth in finding 14 of the staff reports. Next slide, please. Ten impacts to the primary mansion area are proposed throughout the site, as shown in this exhibit. Staff is recommending approval of these PMA impacts as set, also as set forth in finding 14 of the staff report. In conclusion, the subdivision and zoning staff recommends that the planning board adopt the findings and approve preliminary plan subdivision 4 2006 Freeway Airport, as well as TCP 1 016 2020, a variance from section 25 122 B1G, subject to conditions contained in the staff report. The applicant has communicated proposed revisions to conditions of approval contained in the report. Staff concurs with proposed revisions, which are included in the record on page 152 of the additional data. This concludes staff presentation. Thank you, Mr. Diaz Campbell. I'll see if the board has any questions of you at this time. Madam Vice Chair. No questions at this time. Thank you. Okay. Um, Commissioner Washington. No questions. Um, Commissioner Dorner. Yeah, so thank you for the presentation. I have somewhat kind of a 
picky random question. Um, this is not entirely random for me, but on the bicycle parking um, that's being proposed, I noticed that it's only around the clubhouse, that it's not around the other playgrounds that are going to be proposed on the site. Um, and I was wondering why, um, because as an avid biker with kids who love to go to the playgrounds, um, that's one of the, the it's absolutely essential in these kinds of developments. Um, so I don't know if you're able to answer that or if um, we can have the other. Um, so I think that the answer to locations of the bike parking would not be uh, uh, finalized with the uh, preliminary plan of subdivision. We don't have any uh, conditions uh, related to them. Uh, we would evaluate that at the time of the detailed site plan, and at that time we may ask for for the bike racks to be distributed around the site. I thought we had, I thought one of the conditions, I, I know that, that it comes later, but I thought one of the conditions yeah, actually, condition 14F, um, mm -hmm. short-term bike parking at the proposed clubhouse. Um, so I, I think that would probably be an appropriate place to also insert something about the playground as well. Uh, you are correct, sir. I did, uh, I did see that condition. So we may want to turn to the applicant to see if they would be uh, amenable to moving up the of the bike rack locations. Okay. So um, let's, I was going to mention that Mr. Antonetti, you're on on behalf of the applicant. I hope you're hearing this and you can address this. Okay. Um, Commissioner Dorner, do you have uh, other things for uh, Mr. Diaz Campbell at this point? No, that was it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, Mr. Commissioner Giraldo. Well, I mute. just have one question. Okay. Uh, and we, 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 we mentioned it before. What consideration was there to give require six foot sidewalks in view of the pandemic and the importance of social distancing from here forward? Uh, why, re why keep it at only five foot wide? Is that what the law requires? Let me s s turn to Mr. M Mr. Goldsmith and he may need to meet um, um, in a few minutes because not anticipating the question. I don't think that we can uh, require the applicant to enlarge it, but we, you know, of course they could proffer, but Mr. Um, Mr. Goldsmith, do you need a little time? Yeah, I can take a look at that question. Okay. Uh, thank you. Okay, was that it for you, Commissioner Geraldo? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you. So, Ms. I'm going to turn to Mr. Oh, good morning, Madam Chair. Who is this? Oh, this is Brian Barnett with the Transportation Planning okay. Section. I was okay. having difficulty with my mute button. Okay. Um, in response to your question, uh, the DPWT standard sidewalk width is five feet for areas that are not in urban centers. Okay. So I understand that that's the standard. Is there anything, does that mean that we're restricted to only going no more than five feet since since we've uh, asked them to increase it to eight to ten feet on church road see I, I this is what i'm concerned about this pandemic is not going away we're building these new developments and i really think we need to be conscious of uh, people's health and safety and that wider sidewalks is something that we need to consider especially in these small in these developments where people are going to be crowded or with townhouses. So that's my question. No, I, I completely understand. Um, the, the standard sidewalk recommendation comes from our master plan of transportation, which recommends standard sidewalks in the developing and developed tiers of the county. Um, mm -hmm. The wider sidewalk that's on Church Road is part of a recommendation that was from the master plan asking for a wide side path at the major intersections, um, as well as the uh, the, the, the wide shoulder for, for bicycle use. Um, additionally, we're recommending um, a sidewalk on the frontage of Church Road, which goes a little bit beyond what the master plan recommends. Um, the applicant could proffer wider sidewalk, um, but if, for consistency with our master plan, uh, the standard sidewalk is what's recommended. So then, okay, so then what you're saying is that we may have to, uh, 
Mr. Plan? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking it's probably more appropriate for the applicant to comment based on what he's hearing. I would agree, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so um, hold on a second. Okay, so we're going to call on Mr. Antonetti to give the um, applicant's presentation. Mr. Antonetti, um, as, as an attorney, you know the rules. The, the planning board is bound by certain rules. All testimony that your people present must be relevant. It can, we're not um, revisiting things that we cannot address now. Like CB 17 is not CB 17 is not is something that the district council has already enacted. We the board had our own position on it, but we, um, the district council has enacted that law. And um, so I, I don't need you to go into much detail about that. But if you could start your presentation and, and please try to address the, the questions as raised by Commissioners Donner and Commissioners Geraldo as well. Thank you, Mr. Antonetti. Yes. Uh, uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the planning board. For the record, Robert Antonetti with the law firm of Shipley and Horn. We are pleased to represent the African Freeway Realty LLC in this application for a preliminary plan. Uh, I would like to recognize uh, our team. Uh, I'll, I'll be, I will be the main person speaking for the team, and uh, they're here for um, questions or rebuttal uh, as necessary. Uh, so going down the list, I do have Mr. Andrew Rao, um representing Freeway Realty. They also have uh, with him Ms. Jennifer Hearn, Mr. Ken Finley, also representing Freeway Realty. Uh, Ms. Rachel Leitzinger, our uh, civil engineer with Dewberry. It's Mr. Michael Lenhart with our traffic consultants. Uh, Gary Ehrlich with Hush Acoustics. Uh, you have Don Ferrante with Ship Lane Horn. Um, and again, I'm here on behalf of uh, Arthur Horn as well uh, for this presentation. Um, and as you're aware, we're here to discuss the subdivision of Freeway Airport. Uh, I do want to thank Mr. Campbell for his very, uh, Mr. D.S. Campbell for his very thorough uh, review uh, for his willingness to work with the staff and uh, work with the staff members to coordinate our concerns um, and at the same time um, be open to dialogue uh, to address items that were presented in the staff report including conditions and findings. Um, with regards to the questions, I'll just, just jump to that very quickly. Um, Mr. D.S. Campbell is correct that the um, play areas that are shown are our, our conceptual will be further revised uh, at time of detailed site plan. But for the record, we, we do fully anticipate uh, providing bicycle parking at each one of those um, as part of that. So we're not against any condition that reflects as such. Um, uh, Mr. Dorner, if that, if that is the board's pleasure. Um, with regards to sidewalks, um, you know, this project has, has been designed according to standards. Um, yes, five foot sidewalks are provided, but they're also provided on both sides of the street. So, um, so there's uh, opportunities for, for that conveyance pedestrians. Um, you know, um, I'm, I'm hopeful, I know that I don't have a, a crystal ball, I'm hopeful that the pandemic ends. Um, I certainly tell that to, to uh, my family and uh, friends that I believe it will end at some point. Um, but uh, in the interim, um, if this existed today, uh, we feel there would be a ample opportunity for the passage of pedestrians um, safely. I might also add that it was mentioned that there is a private uh, walkway, um, shared use path that's proposed, which is 10 feet. It does transition to 8 feet in certain locations, but that's within the site as well. Um, and I can show that more. I do have an exhibit that mm -hmm. shows how the pedestrian system works together. Um, we're also cognizant of environmental um, concerns in terms of development and reduction of impervious surfaces uh, so you know when you add sidewalk um, adding a foot a linear foot of sidewalk throughout the entirety of the project would add a considerable amount of impervious surface to the project not to mention uh, may have uh, consequential impacts on the layout in terms of um, how, how units or lots are sized and located on the site which are designed to be uh, consistent and respectful of the environmental constraints that exist today so um, I hope that that answers the question, but um, with regards to our presentation, uh, you know, this, this project, uh, we have, uh, our team has done a, 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 a pretty good amount of community outreach um, consistent with this uh, preliminary plan proposal. Uh, certainly we did this in the time of COVID-19, uh, which we uh, were able to mostly utilize it on, on virtual platforms. Um, 
It did include an in-person meeting with members of surrounding communities on March 3rd, 2020. Um, on April 3rd, 2020, we uh, were able to meet virtually, I believe, with the board of the uh, HOA for the Fair, uh, Fairview Manor and Collingbrook HOAs. Um, on April 14th, we met with the Waterford um, board uh, for their HOA. On May 21st, uh, we met with King Isle Estates. Um, on June 15th, we met with the Woodmore HOA board. And on July 9th, 2020, we met with the fair representatives of the Fairwood HOA board, and I believe their management company as well. Um, so the history of the site, um, the site is currently used as a general aviation airport, as, but as Mr. D.S. Campbell uh, indicated, that will end. Um, as you might be able to see, even on the image that's in front of you, um, ghosted underneath this layout is the runway, the hangars, the office building, et cetera, um, the tie-down spaces for the airplanes. Um, they will be completely removed uh, with this project. And the conditions proposed in the staff report, uh, I believe, appropriately address uh, the uh, the process and confirmation of that prior to uh, final plat when, um, if it was operational and licensed at final plat, notes for the APA restrictions would have to be placed on those plats. Um, this this operation will be closed by that time and we're in uh, full agreement with that recommended condition. Um, just quickly, the uh, property was used as a landing strip in, in the 1930s. Uh, it was surrounded essentially by, by very uh, rural activities, farms primarily. Uh, fuel sales and flight training uh, was introduced uh, after World War II. Um, the property is owned by the Rodenhauser family uh, or, or some trust uh, uh, organized uh, for their benefit. Um, the airport was formally incorporated around 1961. In 1968, it was certified as a legal non-conforming use. Um, when I, by that, as you are likely aware, um, it essentially means that the airport use is not compatible with the underlying RA zone, um, and, uh, it, but at the same time, uh, it should be recognized that this property um, for a long, long time has not been used residentially nor agriculturally. Um, I can have some records, uh, I'm sorry, some exhibits, Madam Chair, and I'm not sure what is the best way to do this. Um, I have introduced them all. Um, I can also share my screen. It's I, let, I, I'll let, me, let me let let me say thing. let me say this, Mr. Mr. Antonetti. Let me say this because we have so many exhibits here. There's so many. It might if you can zero in on it quicker than we can. It might make more sense for you to share your screen on it. Mm -hmm. uh, it uh, that would that be fine. And okay, somebody else is talking. Uh, I don't know who's talking. Somebody's on the phone or something. Okay. Okay. All right, Mr. Antonetti. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, I, uh, if I'm given the permission to share my screen, you are. Uh, I could. All right. Let's see here. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. Okay. Somebody's watching a webinar. Not me. This, your indulgence. I apologize for this. Right. No fair trying to show okay. pictures of your kids. <laughs> yes. okay. No, I'm not trying to do that. Um, so, um, so what it's doing, uh, sorry, the GoTo meeting platform is directing me to restart my system to provide access okay. uh, since I haven't shared screen before. So I think Actually, I'll have to rely on okay. Um, okay, Mr. So Diaz Campbell to help walk. Well, Mr. Through. Diaz Campbell is not doing this, so Mr. Flanagan is doing it. Oh, so, I'm can sorry. you tell us? Can you? He's here with me. So, can you tell tell us where, you, where what you're trying to go to? Um, if I could see the, the list that was up on the screen, it's not this. Just uh, these, the exhibits. Um, Lisa, this is the staff slideshow. Um, you're looking for the exhibits. Correct. For number nine. Okay. Um, is, there, is there more than this? Uh, scrolling down. Uh, 
the uh, applicant's exhibit to the end of this document. Um, we need the uh, main. I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Jess Campbell. I, I understand that Jennifer Hearn, the applicant, has it on their screen, and they're able. They okay. should be able to share it. She be authorized to share her screen. Okay. So that can, can you do that, Mr. Flanagan? Okay. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. Okay. Okay. If, um, uh, Jennifer, if you could, um, if you could scroll down to the um, exhibit with the airport and the history of the airport, um, we'll go in that order. Just further. Uh, the next next one, please. There we go. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your indulgence. Do, do you need it enlarged? Technical. Do you need it enlarged at all or no? Um, I if we could zoom very, sh I, I think that's okay. How how is it appearing on your screens? Depends on where you're trying to take us. <laughs> Good answer. Uh, if if we could zoom in one more time, that would be sufficient. But this is really just a, a quick overview. Um, of the airport. Um, Who's doing the zooming? Is that you, Mr. Flanagan? Can we move it over to to the right so we can? Yeah. Is that what you want? That's fine. Okay. That's, that's okay. Fine. okay. That's good. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Um, I can I can work with that. Okay. Um. So um. So again, the uh, the airport began operations uh, many years ago. Uh, what you see right now is the flight pattern uh, for the airport. Uh, it shows the APA zones that exist now since the airport is operational. Uh, I do point that out because it uh, it also shows uh, basically where the planes um, have to uh, circumvent in order to approach and take off um, from from the airport. Uh, there is a very large, uh, significant uh, high tension power line that runs along the west side of the property. Um, on the north side, you'll see 50 John Hanson Highway, which is a freeway. So um, this property um, is tucked in just just in the corner there uh, of between the high tension power line, Church Road and um, U.S. 50. Uh, with regards to this, you'll also see um, marks on here that show um, some crash locations uh, and also some red triangles uh, with numbers in them, uh, which also show accidents that, that included fatalities. Um, I show this because uh, there has been a good number of, of, although there's a long history for the airport, there's also a long history of, of accidents. There, NTSB records reflect 32 accidents since 1983 and a total of 10 fatalities. Um, with regards to um, moving forward, uh, you know, we, we believe that um, given what's developed around the property, which is now no longer farms, but now suburban suburban development, um, that it's highly appropriate for this property to go transition from what is uh, general aviation airport uh, to a suburban residential project. If we go to the next uh, slide down of page two of this exhibit. Um, here is just um, some accidents. There were basically been six accidents uh, in the last seven years. Here's one in August 2014. Uh, we go to the next slide, please. September 2nd, 2013, uh, which uh, closed US 50, uh, May 19th, 2016. Next one, please. Someone, someone seems great. to be having a telephone conversation or something, and, and we can hear it just so they know. Um, I apologize. Okay. No, well, it may not be you. I don't know who it is. It was not you. It's, but... it's not me. Okay. Not you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, uh, so this is May 27, 2019. Um, actually, September 12, 2019 was the last one. And this accident, a um, fully loaded plane overshot the runway uh, and, and actually hit a car on US 50. And uh, by the grace of God, nobody was, nobody was harmed and everybody was able to walk away from that accident. Um, that, uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, there's been within a 10 mile radius over the last 18 months. Here are examples of other accidents um, in general aviation airports. If you go to the next slide, please. And here are the six accidents just from freeway over the last seven years. Um, if we can go to uh, the slide, uh, if we could move up. Um, to, there's a CD-17 exhibit, and I'll explain why. This one right here, thank you. Uh, so um, 
I meant, so this is CD17. Uh, while we're not here to litigate uh, the, uh, the uh, legalities of CD17, I think I think uh, both the applicant, the county, and the some of the opposition um, have you know certain positions on that, and I won't get into that. But this exhibit here shows uh, eligibility um, for CD17, at least uh, for this area. What you see is air, um, two solid white lines, one to the west and one to the east. And within that, um, these are the areas that are potentially uh, possible that can conform to the provisions of CD17. What's outlined in red is the existing land assemblage of the freeway airport, which is subject to this preliminary plan application. Um, I mentioned um, that this legislation in CD17 does allow qualifying properties such as this assemblage to develop using the RTZM standards. Um, again, we are, we, it's our position that, that the law is valid and we won't get into that, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, if we could go up to, uh, there's a color rendering wait, wait, of the overall. Let me say this, plan, Mr. Please. Antonetti. What, what, I'm, what I'm saying about CB17 is you're using that to say that you meet the criteria as, of C, as established by CB17, which is fine. That's the, that's the law that was enacted. But we can't, I, we don't need you to defend the, the law. We don't need anyone else to say the law is about because we can't, we, this board cannot make that decision. It, the decision has been made for us. So I, you know, that's the part I don't want us to get bogged down on the, the legality. Of I, I, it. Okay. I, I, Okay. Understood, and, and okay. this is being shared to show eligibility okay. under under the under the law that exists okay. Um, okay. today. So um, here, and I, and I apologize. I think I think the dimensional dimensionally, this being um, long and, and a, a long plan instead of a, a wide plan, um, really uh, that's that's fine. Thank you. Um, so uh, what you see here is a rendered site plan of this proposal. So the proposal includes 509 units. Um, it's at a density of 4.23 dwelling units per acre. Uh, the current law allows for an eligible property such as this to develop up to 4.5, so we're under that. Um, the unit breakdown um, is uh, 93 single family attached, which you'll see in the eastern side uh, right there. Um, and there is 108 22 rear load townhomes. Um, every townhome proposed here will have two car garages, I should mention that. Um, there are 20, I'm sorry, 284 24 foot wide front loaded townhouses, and there are 24 24 foot wide rear load townhouses, again, with two car garages. Um, the project here uh, really is nestled between um, Church Road, the high tension power line to the west, John Hansen Highway, US 50 to the north. Uh, what we've tried to do is basically cr create four quadrants within this project. Um, in the northeastern quadrant, we have a mix of single family and, uh, and attached units. We also, right at the main entrance, um, you'll see a clubhouse with a pool um, with a, an independent parking lot uh, here. This is a proposal that will be uh, a, a, an amenity space for the community um, and will uh, basically be the uh, kind of part of a grand entrance that's proposed off of Church Road. Um, I will mention too, since we're on the main entrance, uh, we have made a proposal subject to um, DPI uh, approving or Public Works approving the warrant study that we have a full signal at our main entrance. Um, so it'll be a full stop control signal at the main entrance, including additional lane work along Church Road along our frontage, uh, including an appro appropriate turn lanes heading uh, heading north and a through lane. Um, increased shoulders on each side uh, because this portion of the road is somewhat irregular. Um, full dedication of the ultimate master plan right away. Um, heading south over the bridge over 50 will also include a uh, acceleration deceleration lane into both entrances. Um, right there is the second entrance into the project which will be a right in right out exclusively. Uh, so it will not be a full movement intersection, but there will be a, um, uh, additional lane work for both directions um, along the frontage of this project. Um, with regards to getting back to the community, um, within each quadrant, again, we plan to have some type of uh, recreational space. Um, to the northwest quadrant, uh, you'll see um, a, a few things, actually. You'll see uh, a large loop trail, um, which goes along US 50. Uh, you'll also um, see in the northwest quadrant 
uh, a, uh, an area where we can program that with uh, certain amenities, um, as well as uh, uh, extensions of the walkway uh, throughout, throughout this portion, upper half of the project. Uh, heading down to the south, we similarly have, um, uh, again, appropriately buffered um, enclaves of homes that look to respect the full extent practical, the environmental conditions that exist on the site. Uh, so there's actually a pretty um, si you know, significant preservation of woodland uh, that is uh, posed with this project. And it will, uh, will, will fit in um, nicely with the, with the character, appearance, and aesthetic uh, that exists in other suburban neighborhoods um, in this uh, in this vicinity. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Let's move down to the next slide. Thank you. Um, I don't need to spend a lot of time on this. Mr. Uh, Diaz Campbell covered a portion of it. This is actually the full exhibit, uh, which shows parking. I, I wanted to show this because um, being part of many projects, um, and, uh, and the board should, could speak to this, whenever you introduce uh, a mix of units, including attached product, Parking is a concern, and how does how does a project park? Uh, so I did want to emphasize that every unit will have uh, a driveway. Every unit will have an um, attached unit. Well, actually, single attached and detached will have uh, at least a two-car garage. And um, what we've shown here is we've contemplated where um, other parking opportunities will exist, and that includes um, on street and off street parking, as well as parking for the community center. When you tally it up. Um, the parking schedule requirement for, for this project is 1,035. We're proposing 1,274. These will be fleshed out in detail at time of detail site plan, but we wanted to let you know that we're thinking about these things because our goal is to have uh, a high quality community that uh, residents want to, uh, uh, want to live in and will have the opportunity to enjoy uh, a high quality of life. And parking is part of that. Uh, moving to the next exhibit, please. So what you see here, and I'm sorry um, for the scale of it, but what you see here is the, uh, oh, thank you, that's perfect, um, is really a, a kind of a highlight of the amenity areas that I spoke with. You know, there are the four quadrants that we uh, proposed, and these are examples that we think we could carry forward and be um, programmed in these locations. Um, if you look at the legend on the bottom, um, Thank you. Uh, these colors identify the different type of pedestrian activities. Um, and as we, uh, as we mentioned in terms of the sidewalk, there are sidewalks proposed on both sides of the street uh, pursuant to standard. There's over five and a half miles of sidewalk, or actually five and a half miles of sidewalk. We also have in blue this 10 foot wide um, private trail, uh, which is really a loop trail, which is over a mile, uh, which is uh, hopefully a great amenity, which we look to wrap around um, environmental, the environmental area in the center, and also utilize space along US 50 um, as appropriately. Uh, and we also have an eight foot wide trail, which is a necessary transition in order to navigate um, certain areas and respect environmental conditions and stormwater management. Again, to connect um, different, uh, the, the, well, the southwest quadrant and the southeast quadrant of this project. We can go to the next slide, please. Here's the Northern Loop Trail um, that we wanted to show you. Um, during the continuance week, this is one of the exhibits that we were able to prepare um, in addition to um, discussing with staff some of the conditions relative to noise and sound. You know, US 50 um, is, is a, a freeway classification. It is a noise generator. And uh, we certainly, all of our units and outdoor lot areas uh, for our residential units will respect the 65 dBA LDN noise level. The question becomes a little more challenging when, when you use the, the loop trail closer to US 50. Uh, while that ordinarily isn't a, a mandate to be at 65 dBA, we wanted to test it. Um, and we, with our uh, acoustical engineer, uh, we were able to come up with this alignment of where we're at right now. Uh, this includes mitigated sound levels uh, with, a, with an earthen berm, with a sound barrier, uh, and we feel we can make adjustments to either the berm, the sound barrier, or the trail alignment to get us below 65. But just as is, you can see our, cal of the, our experts' calculations show that we're just at 65 or just below in most, most places. So, um, so we're committed to finding a way to, to make that work, but I wanted to show you that we've contemplated, again, as that quality of life, 
uh, what the outdoor noise levels would be on that loop trail to the north. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, it should be mentioned that there is a property to the south. Uh, this is um, owned by uh, Mr. Flick. We call it the Flick property parcel 72. It's 15.68 acres. Uh, we wanted to um, identify uh, for, for our purposes this um, access easement um, from our project. We currently provide access across um, the assembled properties to Mr. Flick and we will continue to do that. This exhibit was included with the preliminary plan package and it does show the 55 foot wide easement um, uh, and we've had discussions with Mr. Flick about this alignment, but uh, it basically follows his current alignment, but we want to make sure that we represent it on the preliminary plan. So access will be um, will be provided through, through this easement and we have coordinated this with Mr. Flick himself. So if we can go to um, the next, well, actually, I think that's that's all for my exhibits. Um, if we can okay, go back. Okay, so while, exhibit, while you're getting ready to go back to whatever you're getting ready to go back to, I need an approximate idea of the length of your presentation, how much time you need still for your presentation. At some point, we're going to break for lunch. I'd like to at least get to some um, citizens if I could. Uh, some, so I just want to. Well, um, I, I, I probably need another 15 to 20 minutes. Um, now, I'll leave it to your discretion if you, I'm willing to yield at this point and come back uh, um, and, and address uh, specific findings or criteria for the preliminary plan. Um, I'll, I'll leave it to your discretion as to how you wish to proceed. And um, okay, so I need for you. So those fifteen to twenty minutes. Um, start thinking about how you're going to condense those. <laughs> okay. 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 Um, right. Say yeah. what you need to say because yeah. I do want to get to some of them, and then we'll try. To, we'll delay our lunch a little bit and pr try to break it too. Okay. Okay. I, I, I apologize. Thank you. No, for no, the, it's for important. The it's important. I will be concise. It's important, but we want uh, we want to hear from everyone. Okay. Understood. Understood. Okay. Yes. Um, well, uh, we do we do agree with the um, with the planning board's staff's recommendation in this case. I do want to point out that um, there's a lot of there's been a lot of discussion um, over the many months about um, about the master plan about the role of CB17. So section 24121A5 of the subdivision regulation states that a preliminary plan and final plat shall conform to map and text of the, of the master plan unless events have occurred to render the relevant recommendations no longer appropriate or no longer applicable. We do know that an event has occurred since the 2006 Bowie and vicinity master plan, and that included uh, legislation, in part included legislation CB17 2019 which authorized eligible properties such as this to develop pursuant to the RT zone standards. So we believe that's an intervening event that would uh, not necessarily make the master plan um, recommendations applicable in this case. And that's what the staff's position is, and we agree with that. However, I should point out that the 2006 Billing Vicinity Master Plan um, does make a recommendation for this property. Uh, it, is, it is called um, classified as residential low it's a yellow color um, for the property here. Residential low is defined in the, in the 2006 plan as areas intended for suburban neighborhoods with single family houses on lots ranging from 6,500 square feet to one acre in size and retirement or planned residential development. Um, there's been some discussion, what well, we propose that this is planned residential development. It does include single family detached, but also attached lots, which are permitted in the zone. Um, this is a suburban uh, development. It's at 4.2 dwelling units per acre. There has been some discussion over the many months of review and, and interaction that this um, is a high density project. Um, well, pursuant to the master plan's designation of residential low, um, uh, if that basically is one to 6.7 dwelling units per acre. Uh, we are at 4.23, so that, that is worth mentioning. Um, high density is as our 2035 general plan uh, denotes, that is set for our centers. Um, for reference, the, uh, the local town center for Bowie recommends a density of 10 to 60, 60 dwelling units per acre. Again, we are at 4.2. That center designation, that is representative of high density. And even at the lowest range of that high density for the lower dense local centers in the general plan, that the lowest range is 10, the highest is 60. We are at 4.2, so I, I, I would um, propose that that is 
um, at, uh, at most moderate density, but um, perhaps even low density uh, in terms of the master plan and general plan together. Uh, so our position is, um, while it may not be applicable in this case because of CB17, the recommendations, the land use recommendations in the 2006 Bowie City Master Plan um, are actually carried forward through this project. And we are consistent with the residential low as defined in that plan um, recommendations. Um, with regards to um, the plan residential development aspect of that, again, this is a preliminary plan of subdivision. We are then have to submit a detailed site plan to show out, show the layout. And that will be evaluate, evaluated against all the criteria for approval of detailed site plans. The criteria in CB17, the RT zone, um, will be reviewed by staff. This will be a planned, a well-planned, uh, thought-out residential development through all the entitlement processes. Um, the general plan, there's been some language about the general plan, this not being consistent with the general plan. We don't feel that's true at all. Uh, there are 12 land use policies set forth in the general plan. They've been articulated in our statement of justification from July 2nd, 2020. Uh, on this, the general plan recommends this property um, basically as, as an established community within the growth policy map. Um, these are areas outside of centers and districts that are served by public water and sewer and suitable for low to medium density developments. Again, we're at 4.23 volumes per acre. Um, again, um, the Bowie Master Plan recommends uh, you know, anywhere from one to 6.7 dwelling units per acre. Uh, this will result, this property proposal will result in density squarely within these master plan recommendations. I will also note that the 2035 general plan recommends an additional 12,600 new dwelling units in the established community areas, and that's set forth in the general plans table 17 on page 100, uh, 110 of the general plan. So again, this proposal is consistent with the land use recommendations and classifications of both the master plan and the 2035 general plan. Um, with regards to the preliminary plan of subdivision, just quickly, uh, the main test in a preliminary plan is adequacy of public facilities. That includes a, a variety of things that you're all very familiar with um, on the board. Um, again, we've been evaluated for fire response times. We are within the seven minute response times. For police response times, we're the, we're, we are within the priority and non priority response time requirements. Um, water and sewer, we are in category four. Uh, which is deemed adequate for capacity. This was looked at um, as part of the water and sewer um, application CR44 2019, uh, where if you look in the staff report, WSSC actually evaluated this for uh, 44 single family uh, detached dwelling units, and it also looked at it for over 600 townhouses. And it did a systems area analysis, and it showed um, that there is adequate capacity in both situations. But nonetheless, this property is, um, uh, I'm sorry, is. Uh, classified systems area for is deemed appropriate. Um, we've heard a lot of discussion over the many months, um, uh, not, not before the board though, um, of schools and what does this mean for school capacity? Well, these units won't come online right away. Um, obviously, there's an entitlement process that's necessary, part of this planned residential development, um, but we believe it will be phased in over years, um, you know, probably a, probably a seven year total um, from uh, beginning to end process, seven or eight years, depending on the market condition. Okay, but I'm, uh, but we're not going to get too they, deep into the school capacity um, issue because, um, and, I, and I know Mr. Goldsmith can address this as well, but um, there are fees that have to be paid. There, there, are, there are surcharges, I, but I will note that um, under the state rate of capacity for all the schools that were, are in this cluster that were uh, attached to this project, um, we are below all of those with our project considered as background for student generation purposes. Okay. But you're correct, Madam Chair, there are surcharges that is the county system for um, moving forward um, in, with new development, residential development projects. And where we're located, um, pursuant to those surcharges, the school sur surcharge is, I believe, $16,748 per unit paid at time of building permit. For 509 units, that would generate $8,524,732. Similarly, there's a public safety surcharge, which I believe presently is $7,909 per dwelling unit, which would total $4,025,681, for a total surcharge for both put together of $12,550,413. Of $12 so, um, so let Not me so let me make sure capacity for the schools, but we will be contributing these fees to pay 
towards uh, essentially our our impact to uh, the school and public safety uh, facilities in this uh, in this area. Because there's no longer an uh, adequate public facilities test for schools. That's correct. Okay. So That's correct. I, so, it, so is a, it is a fee-based system. Correct. Um, just quickly, um, there are no historic resources on the site. Um, parks. Um, there are uh, basically there's 20 acres of parks uh, immediately across the street on uh, Collingbrook. Uh, there's also 40 acres of uh, commission-owned land um, within 800 feet of the site. So um, I believe the parks referral you know references that there's um, a, you know, essentially uh, 60 acres of parkland uh, within 800 feet of this property. Um, additionally, just below that, there's also a Boys and Girls Club Park, which I believe there's some relationship with the commission and that park. I'm not exactly yeah. sure who owns the fee symbol of that, but there actually is a program park on Woodmore Road, um, you know, a bit south of this project. Um, the uh, parks referral references within two miles, there is a park with ball fields um, from this site as well. Um, but we are proposing private amenities. I've gone through those. Uh, and the Parks Department um, recognizes consistent with the uh, conditions or regulations in the subdivision regulations that um, these private amenities would be equal to or better than what a typical park dedication of six point, um, more than six acres would or ordinarily be. And these facilities um, exceed the dollar amount uh, of, of what is uh, otherwise required pursuant to the Parks Department's um, uh, rubric for calculating costs. Um, I believe our, our facilities, at a minimum, are going to be over $1.4 million, probably over that. Um, but uh, the calculation for the Parks Department is, I believe, just a bit over $600,000. So uh, we more than doubled that just with our private amenities um, provided on site. Um, with regards to transportation, one of the main discussions we've heard um, is Church Road. And we, we're very sensitive to that. We wanted to understand Church Road. We wanted to study it thoroughly. Um, we hired what I feel, uh, who I feel is one of the best traffic consultants in the business. Um, is Mr. Michael Lenhart, uh, who has a, a great bit of experience with this. Um, we have studied all the intersections that we've been required to study in our scoping agreement, plus an additional four intersections along the Church Road corridor to understand the capacity, the operation of it. Um, pursuance of the transportation guideline requirements, which is what is being applied to this case. Um, this, I, at this point, I was going to call Mr. Lenhart. I, I don't have to, but I was going to have him explain it because this has been a, a very uh, important issue to members of the community. And uh, you know, again, we wanted to put on the record to the extent you felt it was appropriate, Madam Chair, uh, members of the board, um, how we've approached that in our transportation findings, our, our transportation impact statement. Okay. Mr. Lenhart, if it's something if you have information that will shed some light on this that will be beneficial for everyone, um, go ahead and, and but please try to say what you need to say, but not be un, but do not be unduly repetitive. Thank you. Yes, good afternoon everyone. Thank you. For the record, Michael Lenhart, and I'm gonna be very brief. Uh, I just wanted to kind of describe uh, the process for um, uh, for the public's benefit. The uh, we, what we do is um, we contact Park and Planning early in the process, and we develop a scoping agreement. Um, uh, Park and Planning reviews that scoping agreement, and they have approved it. And uh, after <clears throat> approval of the scope which identified the critical intersections. We looked at other intersections along Church Road that would be of interest to the community, knowing that this is a um, uh, high profile project in the area. And we added additional study intersections along Church Road for informational purposes. Um, we uh, conducted traffic counts, added background developments, site traffic and conducted studies uh, consistent with the guidelines, um, looking at the uh, signalized and unsignalized intersections in the area, and um, the the um, intersections all pass the uh, public facilities requirements. And Rob, I don't. Uh, you and I talked earlier. I don't know if you want me to drill into more detail about this, or just kind of keep it high level for now. You, you and I. You're referring to who, Mr. Antonetti? 
Yes. Okay, I just want to make sure the record's clear about who, who you talk to. Okay. 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 Mr. Antonetti? Yes, Madam Chair. So um, just, just succinctly, um, the, the applicant does agree with the uh, staff findings and recommendations in this case. Um, we, as Mr. Diaz Campbell mentioned, there is um, the revised conditions and um, findings that uh, okay. uh, we, again, used uh, over the past week. We have come to complete agreement with staff on the language of that. Uh, I can go through that. If no, you I, need or, or, you, I need uh, for you. I need. I need. I need to get. A, the citizens were on last week, and then we continued it to this week. I don't want. I'd like to get some of them on now. Um, That's fine. Okay. I have no objection. Okay. That. That'd, be, that'd be appropriate. Thank you. I will see if the board has any questions of you at this juncture before um, before we get to the point where we break. Madam Vice Chair. No, thank you. Okay, um, Commissioner Washington. No questions at this time. Thank you. Okay, um, Commissioner Dorner. No. No, Commissioner Geraldo. Not at this time. I may have it afterwards. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let me do this. Um, who, are we still sharing our screen? Can we unshare it now? All right, so um, I'm going to go down the list, and, and, and I also know we have Michael Jackson on and Brian Barnett Woods for transportation from our staff. Um, I'd like to um, go down the list of some of the citizens. Um, we're not going to get to everybody before we break, but I'm going to ask that you um, be, and then we'll come back. You will, you, you'll have the opportunity to come back, Mr. Um, Antonetti, and you have lots of experts here that are that, um, postponing um, to give the citizens a chance to, to um, get some of their comments on the record if I can. But we will be breaking at about 2 o'clock for lunch. Okay, Beverly Simmons. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Thank you. Good afternoon now. Thank okay. you. Good afternoon. So, first of all, I want to say I'm, I'm here in the Fairview Manor community that's located directly across the street. Okay. Mr. Antonetti just actually told a lie, and I want to put that on the record right now. He said that he met with Fairview Manor community. Mr. Antonetti did not meet with Fairview Manor community. We had a listening session in April. The board had a listening session only to hear what he wanted to say to the community. We told him that we would get back with him to let him know what the community wanted to do. Madam, Madam Chair, I do no, not. No, I do not no, 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 I'm speaking. I'm okay, on. hold on, hold on, hold, hold, hold on, hold on. Everybody, hold on for a second. Okay, hold, everyone hold on for a second. Ms. Simmons, he does have the uh, right to object. I don't know if that's what he's doing yet or not. I'm going to let you finish. Mr. Mr. Um, Antonetti, you can dispute that afterwards if, if that's what you're going to do. Thank you. Thank okay. you. So he, he, we told him that we would get back with him to let him know what the community wants to do. It was only a listening session. We did not see the site plan. Just to put that on the record. So we went forward. The community did vote. I abstained from my vote because I know about this hearing. I didn't want to uh, sway anybody in my direction. But the community decided that they wanted to hear what Mr. Antonetti had to say. So Castor Management, along with the HOA, along with the community, contacted um, Mr. Antonetti, including St. John's property, to go ahead and let the community hear. They did not reply to us. And I want to put that on the record. They did not reply to us. Now, I want to say this. Now, let me ask you a question, Ms. Ms. Simmons. When you, when you got back to them, did you get back to who did you respond to? Was it Mr. Antonetti directly or someone else? We, we responded to St. John's property, Antonetti. Um, I would have to let Erica Fuqua actually say exactly who, because I had, at that time, I asked them, can I step back? And I was still on the board. So just to let you know, my, my name is Gregory Simmons. I was on the board of directors for um, Fairview Manor HOA. I'm the secretary. I was the secretary. I only stepped down on the board because of this case. Okay. Well, I didn't want to have any kind of conflict. And okay. therefore, I didn't want to speak. But I'm, I'm here to let you know that our community is in opposition of this. Okay. They've been saying that they're in opposition of this. This flyer was given to our community with two options 
saying that either they're going to build more airplanes and have more helicopters and increase flying, or they're going to build townhouses. You only have two options. They never told us that we had three options. They never told us that they could build in RA, build 44 homes. They didn't say that. So the community was like, well, maybe we should have townhouses built instead of airplanes, more airplanes. But they never said there was an RA already zoned for this community. So going forward on March 29th, we found that was on March 29th, just to let you know, March 29th, 2019. Then on April 29th, 2019, we have um, one of our neighbors, I'm going to say his name, Leon Bailey, actually signed a letter in the name of the HOA said he was signing for Fairview Manor HOA. Leon Bailey is not on the board. Leon Bailey is not a part of our board members, but he signed a letter saying that the community of Fairview Manor approved this project. That was false. Then Mr. Leon Bailey kept having meetings along with um, Antonetti um, and Proctor, his name is Mr. Proctor, at his house without the entire HOA. We were not invited. I was not invited. The only reason why that we were able to say anything to him, there were two members of the board that actually went to the meeting to give him a verbal cease and desist to not speak on behalf of the HOA. So that was um, last year. Now in June, it's funny, Councilman Derek Davis um, and Lee, uh, Rocky Streeter confirmed Leon Bailey as the redevelopment authority for Prince George's County. And after this, Leon Bailey has all these private meetings at his house with these developers. So I'm gonna keep going. So I insisted that the board get involved. I said, I think we need to get involved because there's a lot of illegal stuff happening to get this development going. We should be able to speak up as a HOA. We should be able to say it. So anyway, we, were, we went forward we, we decided to go door by door because of this fake letter, fake flyer. We decided to go door by door, knocking on every single door. We even knocked on Leon Bailey's door to give them the opportunity to tell people it's not just townhouses that they can build or bring in a whole bunch of helicopters. We also built RA, means 44 uh, homes that are built like ours. We got 60 people, we actually reached 60 people in opposition. Now there's 95 homes in our community. We did reach and talk to 60 individuals who signed an opposition letter. We received one person in support of this plan. And guess who that person is? Leon Bailey. So that's going forward. We told Leon Bailey, you do not act in the, in the, in the name of the um, HOA. I need you all to please note this is a very important fact. We did not find this letter that Leon Bailey had written in the name of the HOA until November the 3rd of 2019. What I say was he was speaking for the HOA. But then we found this letter that I did send to you all that was addressed April 29th, 2019, that he's signing for the community. Now, on April 11th, Mr. Bailey hosted another meeting. He kept holding these meetings, and then he had the nerve to send a statement saying that the community, uh, some of the HOA board members came. No, the HOA board members didn't even know what he was doing. They, uh, one member said she came just because he invited her. But these things were done behind the HOA's um, back. Um, on March 4, 2020, an email was sent to all homeowners asking neighbors not to represent themselves as acting in the name of the HOA. We have to have uh, do this. This had to be done because of Leon Bailey's letter. Moving forward, St. John's property, like I said, on um, March 26, 2020, I received an email from Mr. Greg Proctor who said, he, he is the consultant from St. John's property and said that my name and information was given to him 
from Leon Bailey. The board did listen to John St. St. John's property, but we told them that this is only a listening session. Please don't send us no site plan because we cannot, the board could not make up the mind for the entire community. We said, we will get back with you. And like I said, we did, and they did not get back in touch with us. There's one thing that I do want to say, uh, ma'am, madam. My house was hit by an airplane part. So I have every right to sit here and talk about that. My house was had a great damage to my home from an airplane part. Just because of that accident, that doesn't mean that we agree, that I agree with building all these townhomes and making... Um, church road more busy than it already is. So we don't mind them building, but they need to build homes that are zoned for RA. And just because they were approved to build townhouses didn't mean they have to build them all the way up to the edge. So um, then last thing, schools. We have an email <laughs> that was sent that had uh, Leon Bailey's replies, where all these words were sent that they're gonna help with the school. I have all this stuff written down. They're gonna help with schools. They're gonna, um, I wanna tell you in particular, they wanna help with the schools. They wanna zone, but what we have to realize is the school, the people in our neighborhood, the reason why they send their schools to private schools is because the schools were overcrowded and because of the busing and all of that. So they're not considering this that the schools are not crowded. No, the schools are not crowded because half of these individuals are sending their kids to private school. They're paying double taxes. They're paying for taxes for living in this community. Then they're paying for their kids to go to private schools because of the crowdedness of their school. So Madam Chair, this right here is wrong. Okay. They had no right to come in our neighborhood and lie to our uh, part to our community and the community was scared the community thought that they really were that they increased flight training increased rental activities increased aircraft tie downs lengthen and widen the runway as a secondary runway market airport as a maintenance facility increased transient aircraft resume negotiations with helicopter base law enforcement servicing the washington corridor and they said by nature this would entail a great deal of nighttime traffic. They did that to scare us. And now they're going to sit and pretend like all of this didn't happen? This is how it started, ma'am. This is how it started. The neighbors just did not understand all of these actions. But all they had to do was get an insider inside the neighborhood and lie and sign for the HOA. No, I, I, I okay. the Miss, 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 Miss Simmons, let me, one thing. I don't have, <laughs> hold on a second. I don't have enough information to know whether this, um, Bailey was, did that on his own or whether you're, you're suggesting he was solicited to do that. He, if he, he, without, I, without a vote or from the homeowners association, he did not have the right to speak for the association. I agree wholeheartedly <laughs> with you there. I agree wholeheartedly. But I, I, I can't assume that someone, you, you, you just suggested that the, the applicant got him to do this. And I'm not sure that no, they. No, no, no. What I'm saying is he's, he's here in the neighborhood. Yeah. And he became your Prince George right after that, just a month later. Let me get the right date. The month later, he became Prince George's County Redevelopment. Oh, sorry. That's not us. Okay. You know, that happened, and I can't explain that. And, 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 and actually, the county government has the right to appoint him to that. And I think the county exec... Uh, um, um, the county exec makes those appointments. So that's not even the council. The county executive makes those appointments. Ma'am, um, all I'm saying is we we should, this was wrong. Okay. Was wrong from the beginning. This was step one. This happened on, and I can give you the exact date. This happened on March 29, 2019. Then the young lady that came to our door, okay. you know what she told me? Get in touch with Robert Antonetti at 301. I'm, I ain't going to repeat his number, but it's right here. Okay. Get in touch with her. And then she said her boss, is Proctor. That's who we should get in touch with if we have any kind of disagreement with the two options, not three, that are allowed to build on Freeway Airport. So okay. it was all 
based on a lie. Now, you're talking about veterans. I'm, this is my last thing I'm going to say. I am here speaking on behalf of the disabled veterans in our neighborhood. There are nine of us. I am a retired from the United States Air Force after 22 years, but I'm also a 100% disabled vet. Okay. I used my VA loan to purchase this house. So did these other nine veterans in our neighborhood. We moved here because of the low traffic, because of the low density. And I think that it's just unfair that one homeowner can come in and change this whole process. But one home, what, okay, they, let me say this first. First of all, several things. Okay, because yes, I, 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 I hear your unmistakable passion and it's understandable. Uh, second thing is, um, thank you. Um, because as I acknowledge, I, I'd love to give you a salute. I'm not a veteran at all, but I, I, but I do honor and reckon, I, and honor and appreciate you. And I mean that with all sincerity. It's just, what you all do for our country and, for, and to protect us is, yes, is incredible. So I appreciate that. Um, Thirdly, I know you're frustrated with the whole Bailey situation. That is outside the scope of what we can consider. I'm glad you took the steps to stop him from purporting to act for the Homeowners Association. So, so, so you went, um, I'm glad you did that. Um, um, but the, so I want, and, and the issues now are, I know people are against the schools, you know, schools might be overcrowded. We, that is not something we can consider at this juncture. We're not, the law changed some years ago. So um, there are surcharges that, that each home has to pay, but we cannot consider the schools in, in determining whether a preliminary plan meets the legal criteria or not. Um, the next thing is um, that there's been a lot of, I looked at every single exhibit, there's a, been a lot of discussion about people being very, very upset about C, CB17 and the zoning and, and, um, and what the, the zoning now allows in the RA zone. Um, um, you, and everybody submitted the planning board's comments too. Not everybody, but several people committed, um, submitted that in terms of your exhibits because it has my signature on it addressing the county council. And that was our position. And we felt very strongly about it. The, but nonetheless, the law changed. So, so now we have to look at things from where we stand now. So basically what I'm hearing from you is that you're not opposed to development. You, you're, you're asking, you're frustrated with, the, with some of the things, the process, and you're asking that why does it have to be right up to the, up to the, the line? That's what I hear you saying. And I just want to yes, make sure. Yes, ma'am. Yes, in sign language. Okay. 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 I just want to make sure I got you correctly. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Ms. Simmons, for your um, testimony today and also for your service. I'm going to see if the board has any questions of you. Madam Vice Chair? No questions, but thank you for your service. You're welcome, ma'am. Okay. Um, Commissioner Washington? Uh, well, thank you, Ms. Simmons. Um, I just like to, it's a clarifying question. You, you keep holding up that flyer. Yes. I don't know that I saw that as part of any backup. Who, where did that originate from? From Mr. Mr. Antonetti and uh, Proctor, they made this flyer. Their name is on it. Okay. And they said only two options. They sent to every neighbor in our in our community. They said it was only two options available: to either expand the airport, bring in helicopters, like I say all that, or build townhouses. Okay. So the community said, "Well, we should just build townhouses." No, no, no. Okay. I understand. You're, you're My question was, "Where did you receive it from?" Because it's not oh. included as part of our backup. So. Well, we, we forwarded it to Prince George's County and we forwarded it to the clerk. We forwarded this very um, uh, exhibit. Okay. All right, but we're, we, we are not the county council or the clerk. I just okay. wonder if it had been submitted as part of your backup. That's yes. really what I'm trying to understand. Yes, okay. well, um, it came from Mr. Antonetti and okay. whoever it is, okay. Thomas Proctor. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay so. Um, Commissioner Geraldo, any questions? Uh, no, I, I want to thank Ms. Simmons. I was wondering if that flyer can be made part of the record. Okay, no, it, it, it cannot. Okay, if it's not already in, but I'm, I'm going to have Mr. Antonetti. Um, Mr. Antonetti, you need to keep a running log because there are many things you're going to have to address. And I know, and I'm going to come back to you after the questions because I think you had an objection. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, did, so, was that it for your Chair, questions? Yes. Yes. Well, I wanted to know whether or not I could make that a, as a commission exhibit. 
No, because it's, it's, it's too late. Since, since Ms. Simmons. No. Even the commission. No. Is no. What okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, Commissioner Dorner. No questions, but but yeah, thank you for your service. I like the uh, the Air Force Blue that you've got on. Yes, that's a wrap. Thank for, you. For um, yes, sir. Okay. Um, now I'm going to go to the next speaker, um, Mr. I'm going to go to you quickly, Mr. Antonetti, because I I, I prevented you from from making. Uh, for making an objection, I think, and I, and it, and you have the right, right to preserve it for the record if that's what you need to do. Right. Well, I, I well, I object to the document. Um, that's, that was a doc, that was a flyer that was uh, circulated um, as initial outreach um, prior to CB17 uh, or as part of CB17. So it's not part of this preliminary plan. Um, the meetings, the dates that were discussed were general, but uh, my my general objection was being called uh, called a liar. Uh, was, that's not my intent. Although I, I apologize for my outburst, I do thank Ms. Simmons for her service. Um, I've actually met with her a couple times throughout the CB17 process, um, and uh, now that I got to, got to see her, I, I do recall that. So um, I do apologize for my outburst. But my general objection is that uh, it wasn't we didn't lie; it wasn't our intent to lie. But um, we can have differences about the dates, what was said at the meetings. Um, if, we can discuss that okay. at this time or some later no, time, but that's what, my general objection. No, okay, we know your, your objection is preserved for the record in terms of being called a liar and in terms of this, this, uh, um, some information that was passed on prior to the, the enactment of CB17, um, if that's, that's your position anyway. Um, you will have the opportunity to address some of these things because one of the things Ms. Simmons did indicate was what I what I interpreted this to mean was that there was not an exchange. She, the the, pe the the association got to listen, the, the, and and but not comment or or it doesn't sound like there was a um, Q and A or any. It wasn't it didn't sound like it was an exchange. It sounded one sided. That's what I interpreted right. it to mean. I'll address that later. Okay, um, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to go on. We have a few minutes. I'm going to go on to Car Carol Boyer. I do have one thing to say. Yeah. It wasn't regarding CB uh, 17. It was regarding this 2 40006. Okay. And we decided to move with it. Okay. So it had nothing, you know, he, he, we just never saw the site plan. Okay. But we're going to, okay. okay. Thank you. But I want to, uh, okay, so I'm going to go on to Ms. Boyer. Carol Boyer? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Um, so if you wish to associate your comments, any of your comments with um, Ms. Simmons, you can, or and supplement if you like, or you can start anew. But not, but we're asking that folks not to be overly repetitive, though. Thank you. No, I will not be overly repetitive, um, but I support all the data that we have that Ms. Simmons presented. Um, my name is Carol Boyer. I've been a resident of Prince George's County for more than 64 years and a homeowner residing in Bowie, Maryland, along Church Road for 31 years. I am in the RA zone, where it is one home for two acres. That is why we purchased our property 32 years ago. So I am before the Prince George's County Planning Board stating that this site plan application 420006 should not be approved. Now, as we all know, which Mr. Antonetti has referenced at least three times in his presentation, then we do have a large body of evidence that underscores that only two parties, the developer, St. John Properties, and Freeway Realty LLC was created within the last less than a year, which is a subdivision of St. John Properties, and the Freeway Airport owner. They will be the only parties to benefit based on a text amendment passed by the Prince George County Council. This text amendment has a legal challenge, as you all know, to be decided in the Anne Arundel County Circuit Court as spot planning, quote, unquote. And this planning board, as you underscored, uh, Chairman Taylor, has, has had issues with this text amendment in May and November 2019. I am one of the petitioners in the judicial review case, number CALI 9-40048. I do know and I, I, and I appreciate where the planning board is. You're at a hard spot because you have to move forward with what's on the table right now. But I do want to bring back what the planning board stated and ask questions of Mr. Robert Antonetti, 
who represented the Freeway Airport property owner at the May 2nd, 2019 hearing. No, um, so we're, I, Mr. Antonetti is not, he is presenting the case on behalf of the applicant. Now, if you have something to address on that, I and mean, we have copies of the letters, several, first of all, we know what we, we can take administrative notice of. of well, I do want, I do want to make the statement and quote. Mr. Antony was challenged by a board member over the choice of a zoning text amendment instead of an application mm -hmm. for peace yes. milling rezoning or zoning map amendment. And Mr. Antonetti stated, we did contemplate what would be our timeline right. in terms of rezoning. If we did a peace mill rezoning application, but given the circumstances of the airport where they need to make a faster decision, and I'm emphasizing the word faster decision, whether to continue or intensify operations or go in another direction, given their financial circumstances, emphasis is added, and given some of the uncertainty involved with the zoning ordinance and the general map amendment, this seemed a more direct way to address it. Yes. So the freeway airport owners chose to pursue a site-specific text amendment instead of a piecemeal rezoning as recommended at least twice by the zoning board. Right. And we do now, and I won't repeat that because you've already stated that the okay. zoning board. Right. We, has been in the right. we already ha we have we your have exhibit to... in the record okay. with, with as okay. emphasized, even with your emphasis on it. We poured over that yesterday, um, so we have that. Yes. It's a moot point yes. at this point, except for you know. I know it's a moot point. Okay. However, we don't need a text amendment to close a property. We it's don't done. Need a text amendment. It's done yeah, though. We don't need we, that. You're beating, you're beating, it's done. This is the law that we have, to, it's done as, for purposes of this board. So we, our hands are tied on that issue. That we have to. Okay, well I do want, I do want to mention this one thing that was not mentioned and I understand where you're at. It seems, okay. All right, the county council and the planning board are not taking into consideration the Prince George's County, Maryland National Park and Planning Commission's transit-oriented development called TOD, which generally refer to real estate development within walking distance of a transit station that is designed to increase transit ridership and reduce reliance on automobiles. The TOD is considered an important component of any smart growth strategy because it aims to reduce fall, environmental impact, and car use. We already heard that we're going to have more than 500 more homes there. That's going to be at least a thousand more. Homes. Not to mention Amazon delivered vehicles, FedEx vehicles, other vehicles, UPS vehicles, mail vehicles, and other types of vehicles that are going to be coming to do whatever service work is being done there. So TOD is considered an important component to reduce this flow. Section 7-101 parentheses M of the transportation article defines a TOD as dense, mixed use, deliberately planned development within a half mile of transit stations. This development has no such TOD and there is no public transportation available for more than two to three miles in all directions. Mm -hmm. So, so the RA zone without amendments is already sufficient and the path to closing the airport is already prepared and paved. And we don't want the planning board to be part, you know, they will be, but I know you have to move forward with a law that has been passed and you challenged it twice, but it's now before you and I understand where you where you need to be. So it's being moved forward as though no legal challenge has been filled, filed, which, are, which the property owner is submitting this application. I urge the planning board not to approve application number 42006 for free airport property. Thank you for your time, Madam Chair, and the rest of the board. Thank you, Ms. Boyer. Um, I, and we have your we have your nine-page written statement here. And and let me tell you something. We have gone through it with a fine-tooth comb. It's all noted and highlighted and notes is there. So uh, understand your words are not falling on deaf ears, but we do have our parameters here. So um, thank you so much. Um, thank you very much. Okay. So um, all right, we it, we're at the point where we need to take a break. Um, so this is going to take this is going to take a while. And look, and and citizens, you the two have spoken so far. You've been wonderful. You've been absolutely wonderful because we're all being considerate of the, those who we, who are yet to follow. So the board is going to take a break, and we're going to resume at two forty-five. Okay.
So Madam Chair, is there, uh, can I get some quick clarification? Because I think you mentioned that we couldn't consider uh, specific pieces of evidence, but I just wanted to clarify that. Who was who, asking this uh, question? This is Erica Fakwa, my apologies. Okay, okay. I think you mentioned school data or no, Right, when, when we get to you, we can't, no, I'm, I, I'm not saying we can't consider evidence. I'm saying that the law changed, so school overcrowding is not an issue that's before us. There's no adequate public facilities test for schools. There's not a consideration to approve or it is not a legal basis to approve or deny a, um, a preliminary plan of subdivision. It is, it is, okay, it is so not. Okay, so when it comes to my session, can I clarify some of the staff report? You, when when we get school. to you, you you can say what you okay. need to say, and and if it's if it's you know if it's within the scope of what we can consider today, that's fine. If it's not, we'll let you know. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. The board's going to break. We'll resume at two forty-five. Thank you. We have the folks sign um, back up. Um, I see the full board, all five planning board members. Um, I see Mr. Diaz Campbell. Um, we have everyone here uh, at, the, at the administration building. Um, Mr. Antonetti, are you on? I'm here, Madam Chair. Okay, Mr. Lenhardt, are you on? Yes, yeah, sorry, I'm here. Okay, thank fine. you. Um, um, we have the folks that you need, Mr. Roud. Are you on? Okay. Um, Mr. Elrich. I mean, Ehrlich. Earl I'm sorry, Ehrlich. That's a big difference. Okay. Is Mr. Ehrlich on? He's unmuted. Mr. Ehrlich. He muted himself. Okay, Mr. Ehrlich. Okay. Um, and Rachel um, Leisinger? Present. Okay. So we have the people. Uh, Mr. Ferrante? Present, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, Beverly Simmons? I'm here. Okay. Thank you. Wonderful. Ms. Boyer? <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Millie Hall? Present. Kathleen Barris? Present. Wonderful. Miller Einsel? Present. James Riley? Present. Okay. Eric o Ofuqua? Ofuqua, excuse me. That's how you pronounce it, I think. And I see your name there, but we have to. Is he unmuted? <laughs> God bless you. You need to unmute it on your end, Mr. Ofuqua. 